Well, it, it's lovely to be out on such a sunny evening in Edinburgh, but it's a shame that we have to be out tonight protesting against the two-child cap and the rape clause well more than a year since Alison Thulis, my colleague at Westminster, first spotted it in the small print of a Tory budget. I'm very glad to see such a huge demonstration today and so many people still coming along one year after the rape clause came into force um, to show their opposition to this vile and despicable policy. The UK government have never been able to justify this policy and we saw that this week with Esther McVeigh's pathetic attempts to say that the rape clause was somehow double support for women and that gives them some kind of chance to talk about the most um, appalling and disturbing experience of their life. As you can see behind me, we're at the very beginning of the All Under One Banner Rally. You can obviously hear the, drum, the pipers behind me as events are about to kick off. It's time to aim high, look resolutely outwards and never, ever accept second best. Above all, it's time to believe that we can. We can build that better country we know is possible. And friends, we will. If you enjoy watching our programmes, please help us to be Scotland's independent broadcaster by signing up to become a Broadcasting Scotland supporter. Wherever you stand, get the fresh view of what's happening in Scotland with iScot. Celebrate everything about our country with intelligent, in-depth insight from lifestyle, culture to puzzles and all the opinions you'll need. Whether it's digital or by post, subscribe now to iScot. The proceeding was... Order! Order! Questions to the Secretary of State for Scotland, Joanna Cherry. Number one, please, Mr. Speaker. Indeed. Secretary of State for Scotland, Secretary David Mundell. Mr. Speaker, can I begin by wishing Shelley Kerr and the Scotland uh, team uh, all the best in tonight's Women's World Cup match against Argentina? Although results have not necessarily gone the team's way to date, they have indeed been a credit to Scotland and they have transformed people's views on women's football. Mr Speaker, with permission, I will answer questions 1 and 11 together. I have regular discussions with the Prime Minister on a range of matters relating to EU exit. It is the Government's position that leaving the EU with a deal is in the best interests of Scotland and the UK. Cherry. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I think one thing the Secretary of State for Scotland and I can agree about is wishing uh, our colleagues well in the football. And, of course, things always go very well for the Scots when Argentina and football are concerned. <laughs> um, Mr Speaker, it, it seems clear that the Conservative Party is on the verge of electing a new leader and a new Prime Minister whose primary purpose will be to deliver a no-deal Brexit. 
Is the Secretary of State prepared to be part of a no-deal cabinet that will shrink our economy by up to 7 per cent and put 100,000 people in Scotland out of a job? Mr Speaker, obviously uh, I am answering questions on behalf of Her Majesty's Government and not leadership candidates uh, today, but I am clear that uh, those uh, aspiring to the leadership of the Conservative Party do in fact want a deal and want to leave uh, with, uh, with a deal. And throughout uh, this process, compared to the honourable and learned lady, I voted on every occasion to leave the EU with a deal. She has never done so. Henry. Yeah, Thank you, yeah. Mr Speaker. His own government's analysis, every piece of it, shows that there is no version of Brexit that fails to harm Scotland. Aye, aye, and aye. new YouGov polling shows that Tory members would prefer Scotland to be an independent country aye, rather aye, than aye, stop aye, Brexit. Aye, aye, aye. So which choice should the Scottish Secretary make? A devastating no-deal Brexit Britain or giving the people of Scotland the choice to be an independent European nation? Mr Speaker, it won't surprise you to hear me say that Scotland has already uh, made its choice on whether to be independent or part of, uh, or part of uh, the United Kingdom. But the poll which the uh, Honourable Gentleman refers to is based on a false premise. This Government is about delivering Brexit and keeping Scotland at the heart of the United Kingdom. John Lamont. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I wonder if the Secretary of State um, could tell us how much money has been given by the Scottish Government to local uh, authorities in, uh, in uh, Scotland to prepare uh, for our bread, uh, uh, Brexit from the European Union. Well, Mr Speaker, as far as I understand, of over £100 million which the UK Government has made available to the Scottish Government to help prepare uh, for Brexit and indeed a no-deal Brexit, Precisely none of that money has been allocated directly to local authorities or indeed Police Scotland. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Further to the reply that the Secretary of State gave a few moments ago, does he, does he agree that the majority of Scots voted in the 2017 general election for parties that were committed to delivering the 2016 <laughs> referendum and that it would be a dereliction of our democratic duty not to do so? Yeah. I, I absolutely I agree with uh, my right honourable, uh, my honourable friend, and that's uh, why uh, this government is committed to respecting the outcome of both the referendums that have taken place uh, in Scotland: the 2014 independence referendum, where people voted to remain in the United Kingdom, and the 2016 uh, EU referendum, where people across the UK voted to leave the EU. David Hanson. Uh, given the Scottish Parliament Government and the Welsh Assembly in my area have both said that the economy of Wales and Scotland will fall by around 7 to 8 per cent on no deal, what has the Secretary of State himself said to the five leadership candidates left about the impact of no deal and why he should avoid it? Oh, it is not just to the five leadership candidates, but it is in this House and elsewhere. I have been very clear that a no deal uh, exit from the EU is, is very bad for Scotland, and we want to avoid that. We want to leave with a deal. But the leadership candidates, as I understand it, are all setting out a premise on which we could leave with a deal. Brexit is already having an impact on Eastern Bartonshire's major employers. Aviva have announced that they will be making job losses in the coming years, and a major engineering firm that is an award-winning exporter has told me about the impact that it is having negatively on their business. Knowing what he does about the devastating impact on Scotland, how can the Secretary of State possibly countenance the kind of no deal or hard Brexit deal that is being offered by his co colleagues in the leadership election in his party? 
Mr Speaker, I thought for one moment the Honourable Lady was going to refer to her own leadership uh, election campaign, and if I did not think that it would stymie her chances, I would wish her well uh, uh, in that uh, campaign. But she knows, she knows that it is the current uncertainty that is the, the most serious problem for business in Scotland and elsewhere. We could have ended that uncertainty much earlier by voting for a deal. Gully. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, the, my right honourable friend spoke about £100 million given to the Scottish Government to tackle a, a, a Brexit. Can he confirm, though, that Scottish nationalists have chosen to spend £10 million of that to, to plug holes in their own budget? Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I very much fear that there are so many uh, holes in the Scottish Government uh, budget that a mere £10 million will not uh, fill many holes. Paul Sweeney. And I share the Secretary of State's congratulations and best wishes to the Scotland women's team, and particularly uh, to Leanne Crichton, who forms part of the squad, is from Deniston in my constituency. It was a pleasure to meet her just a couple of weeks ago. But speaking of team players, the Secretary of State has refused to rule out working with the calamitous former Foreign Secretary, who is prepared to see the United Kingdom leave the EU on disastrous no-deal terms. A majority of his party's members now would rather see the economy crash, the United Kingdom itself fragment, and their own party destroyed to secure Brexit. It is a party that is now better described as the English Nationalist Party, rather than a party that wishes to preserve the unity of the British people. Has it now dawned on the Secretary of State that he might not have left the Conservative Party yet, but the Conservative Party has certainly left him? Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, Speaker, I'm sure that read better in the press uh, uh, release. The position of this uh, government is quite uh, clear. We are about honouring both referendums, the 2014 Scottish uh, independence referendum and the 2016 EU uh, <laughs> referendum. And I'm not going to take lessons from the Honourable uh, Gentleman on uh, party affairs when his colleague Neil Finlay in his resignation letter described the Scottish Labour Party as having a toxic culture with external and internal infighting always to the fore. Shepherd. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. The Secretary of State has been consistent, if nothing else, in denying the aspirations of the Scottish Parliament to offer the people of Scotland a choice between remaining in a Brexit Britain or taking control of their own affairs. Indeed, he made it a central plank of his party's election campaign last month. In that election, the Scottish Conservative and Unions Party received 11.6 per cent of the votes. Given that only one in nine people support his proposals, isn't it time to demonstrate some grace and humility and stop behaving like a colonial overlord? Well, I think that, uh, Mr uh, Speaker, if grace and... A humility is required. It comes from the SNP and still in the fact that they still fail to recognise that in the 2017 general election, on which Brexit was a key issue, their vote fell by more than 500,000 and they lost 21 seats. Johnny Shepherd. Mr Speaker, I think many of us do appreciate that this may well be the Secretary of State's last outing in this chamber in his current role, so his mind may be somewhat distracted, but he must surely recognise that circumstances have now changed. His party is about to elect a leader and force upon us a Prime Minister hell-bent on a no-deal Brexit. If that happens, will he continue to refuse the right of the Scottish Parliament to consult people in Scotland on their own future. Mr uh, uh, Speaker, I understand the Scottish Parliament is going to be consulting people uh, through uh, a People's uh, uh, Assembly uh, process, although I do not uh, agree with it. When we have a Scottish Parliament with 129 elected representatives, I feel they, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, that is the forum in which these matters uh, uh, should be discussed. But the Honourable Gentleman is wrong in the way that he characterises the Conservative leadership uh, Candidates. Those candidates have made it clear that their preference would be to leave the EU with a deal. Masterton. Number two, Mr. Speaker. Indeed. Secretary of State. 
Mr Speaker, we are helping families to keep more of what they earn through raising the personal allowance, which went up to £12,500. As a result, 2.4 million Scottish taxpayers have received a cut in their tax in 2019-20 compared to 2015-16 due to this measure. Oh, Master Turn. You, Mr. Speaker, as well as letting hard-working families keep more money in their pockets, in stark contrast to the Scottish Government, who are taxing 22,000 of my constituents yeah, 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 yeah. more than they would if they lived that's in England, that's that's raising the personal allowance also takes some of the lowest paid out of tax altogether. So, can he confirm how many people in Scotland have been taken out of paying income tax by the Conservative Government? Yeah. Mr Speaker, thanks to this Government's increases in the personal allowance, 135,000 Scots no longer have to pay any income tax at all. That is the record of this Conservative Government cutting tax, as opposed to the SNP Scottish Government that is making Scotland the highest tax part of the UK. Thank you very much. Does the Secretary of State realise that of those tax uh, benefits that are gained, people on universal credit automatically lose 63% of them? contributing to the fact that over 34,000 tenants on universal credit now owe over, over £21 million in rent arrears, an average of £644 in Scotland. Will he look at the impact of universal credit on Scottish people, in particular low-income households? Well, I'm always uh, willing, uh, Mr Speaker, to look at, at specifics. Of course, we're working uh, with the Scottish Government to uh, bring forward the variations in uni- uh, universal Uh, credit that they uh, are seeking, and one of those does relate to the payment uh, of uh, rent. Uh, Another point which I, of course, have made many times at this dispatch box, the Scottish Government also have wide-ranging powers to make additional payments to people in Scotland if they chose to do so. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Armed armed forces serve the whole of the United Kingdom. So, as an English MP, I am very proud that our United Kingdom Government is supporting armed forces personnel stationed in Scotland to the tune of £4 million. So, does my honourable friend agree that it is only the UK Government that can actually stand up for our armed forces personnel? Mr Speaker, it, it, it was. A, uh, a very positive uh, announcement that the Ministry of Defence uh, made again uh, this year, confirming extra payments to servicemen and women in Scotland who have been sent there uh, for operational requirements to ensure that they are not penalised for serving in Scotland by the SNP's high tax policies. Jamie Stay. Mr Speaker, I note what the, the Secretary of State says about taxation. However, people living in remote parts of the UK, such as my constituency, are paying crippling, crippling delivery charges for goods. Would we not help uh, the incomes of families by tackling this really serious problem? Well, I, I, I recognise the issue which the Honourable Gentleman has raised, and obviously it has been raised many times in this uh, chamber by uh, my right honourable friend, the member uh, for Murray. The Government is very seized uh, of uh, this issue and looking to try and resolve this inequity where people living in remote and rural areas are asked to pay disproportionate delivery charges. Mr. Malcolm MacDonald. Mr Speaker, although it is the case that the lowest paid members of the armed forces in Scotland pay less in tax than their counterparts ah, 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 can he confirm that the mitigation payments made by the United listen. Kingdom Government to the highest earners in Scotland were subject to tax? Yeah. Oh. Oh. Every, pay, every uh, payment that is uh, uh, made is subject uh, to the tax system. That is self-evident. But what these payments do is that they mitigate, they mitigate the payments that armed forces are receiving that are reduced by the SNP's high tax approach. Alan Brown. Number three, Mr. Speaker. In Secretary of State. Mr. Speaker, with uh, your permission, I will answer questions three, six, seven, and twelve together. This is a joint review between the UK Government and devolved administrations, and it is incumbent on all administrations to make progress. There are ongoing discussions across the work streams of the review, which will be discussed at the next meeting of the JMCEN next week. Alan Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The front runner to be the new Prime Minister has published an anti Scottish poem. Yep. He believes a pound spent in Croydon is of more value than a pound spent in Strathclyde. 
and a Scottish MP should never be Prime Minister. Does he agree with me that the former Foreign Secretary would be a disaster for inter-government relations and a boost for Scottish independence? Mr. Mr. Speaker, every Scottish questions we we hear we, you know, we hear the assertion that this or that uh, will be a boost for Scottish independence. It's got to the stage where if the chicken crosses the road, it will be a boost uh, for Scottish independence. It's for individual candidates in the Conservative leadership uh, election to ask, answer questions about their own uh, position and background. Mr. Callum, get in there, man. Yeah. During an open session of the PAC Act Select Committee on Monday, 20th of May, the Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster was asked if he could give an update on the progress of the review of intergovernmental relations. He replied, I cannot put a firm timescale on this, perhaps if we are looking towards the end of the year. Given the time that has lapsed and the uncertain political times that we are living through, is that good enough for Scotland? Mr Speaker, I, I, I do believe that, that progress is being made and I am hopeful that next week, uh, when there is a meeting of the GMCN, there will be the opportunity to discuss principles that would underpin a, uh, the, the new uh, IGR and, uh, agreement. And that was something that was discussed with both Welsh, uh, of Welsh Government Ministers and uh, Mr Mike Russell at the last meeting of the GMCN. Harry Black! Runner to become Prime Minister has previously written that government by a Scot is just not conceivable in the current constitutional context. Yeah. Does the Secretary of State agree with this opinion and does he believe that such an opinion is helpful to intergovernmental relations? Uh, I, 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 don't agree, I don't agree with uh, that and I'm sure, I'm sure the Honourable Member for Eastern Bartonshire aspires to the office of uh, a, a Prime Minister should she uh, lead her party. So, no, I don't, I don't agree with that analysis. Deirdre Brock. Thank you. Mr Speaker, the Scottish Affairs Committee should be holding the Scottish Secretary to account, but he keeps refusing our invitations. So, as this is his last question session before leaving office in the great Tory purge to come, does he agree with me that the Scotland office is no longer fit for purpose, that its function as a propaganda unit is unbecoming a Department of Government, and that the Department needs a serious reform and overhauling, or quite Quite simply abolish. What is the point to the Scottish office? Yeah. Very simple answer, Mr. Speaker. No. I'm grateful. Mr. Douglas Ross. Thank you much, Mr. Speaker. Like myself, the Secretary of State has served as a councillor, an MSP, and an MP. So, would you agree with me that you can have political differences within and between the various levels of government, but that shouldn't be misconstrued as a breakdown in intergovernmental relations? Yeah. Hey. I I absolutely uh, agree with my uh, honourable friend. Many of the disagreements between the Scottish Government and the UK Government uh, are political differences rooted in the fact that this Government wants to respect the outcome of the 2014 independence referendum and the SNP Scottish Government wants to have another referendum. They are political disagreements. Much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, will my right honourable friend uh, confirm that £1.3 billion has been allocated to city and growth deals to Scotland and actually lessons learned through the city and growth programmes are being played into the union strategy and also into governmental relations so we take the positives out of this incredible investment that's coming to Scotland from the UK Government. Well, I always believe, Mr Speaker, that the city and growth deals are a, a clear example that the two governments can work constructively uh, together for the benefit of people of Scotland. That's what people in Scotland want to see. Congratulating the Honourable Gentleman of Perth and North Perthshire upon a particularly splendid tie. I call Mr Pete Wishart. Oh, here, here. Yes, I'm always hello. grateful to you, Mr Speaker, and thank you for that. Thing you can say about Mr. It. Mr Speaker, the Scottish That's Affairs the Committee has just released their report on intergovernmental relations, and it's an evidence-based, wide-ranging <coughs> report on a number of important issues. But what this cross-party report says about his office is that it's failed to keep pace with devolution and that most direct intergovernmental relations are conducted out with his department. Yep. Now, some of these press comments I notice that he's not actually taken all this seriously, but will he now agree to a proper review of his office and his department? Yeah. Hey! 
I, I don't know what press uh, comments uh, the uh, honourable gentleman uh, is referring to, because although we have our political uh, differences, I do respect the work of his committee, and I've been very clear that I welcome the opportunity for a review of the Scotland office. But I'm confident that will review will result in an enhanced Scotland office, not the loss of the Scotland office. Leland. First of all, Mr Speaker, I'd like to associate myself with the remarks and wish the Scotland team all the very best in their final match tonight. Mr Speaker, two parliamentary select committees have now made recommendations that the Secretary of State's role should be abolished. The Secretary of State ignored Labour's warning about the democratic deficit of the JMC. He botched the devolution element of the Brexit bill and he has failed to secure funding for Scotland as part of the Stronger Towns Fund. Does the Secretary of State now accept any responsibility whatsoever for presiding over the mess that has led to the unprecedented step of two parliamentary committees calling for his head? Mr Speaker, I I don't know whether the Honourable Lady read the Scottish Affairs Select Committee uh, report, it might have been helpful because it doesn't call for the abolition of the Scotland office. Obviously the SNP want to see the Scotland uh, office abolished. They want to see the UK Government abolished. It calls for a review. I think after 20 years of devolution, a review is a perfectly appropriate step to take. Well, Mr Speaker, The issue, of course, is that how did it get to that point? And the gentleman's handling of all of the issues I've outlined really confirms why we are in this mess. But given that he is unhappy in his work, then it may well be be that his threats to resign um, may well be fulfilled by the right honourable member uh, of Uxbridge and South Ruslip in, in a short period of time. Mr Speaker, both the Secretary of State and Ruth Davidson have flip-flopped on the work on whether they would work with the new foreign sec- with the foreign secretary if he becomes prime minister. So, does the secretary of state think that if the former foreign secretary is elected as prime minister, his diplomatic skills will come to the fore, that he will improve relations between the Scottish and UK government, or would it indeed be another? Nazarene Regari Radcliffe moment. Mr Speaker, firstly, I'm very clear, I respect democracy, I will respect the result of the Conservative uh, leadership election, but all five of the candidates still in the race are very clear. They are unionists, and that's what makes them different from the Leader of the Opposition. They won't be cozying up to the SNP to have another second independence referendum. Mr Speaker. Well done. Secretary State. Mr Speaker, strengthening and sustaining the union is a key priority for the UK Government. This Government delivers for the people of Scotland day in, day out, whether through creating jobs, opportunities and long-term growth, or keeping our citizens safe. So Henry Bellingham. I agree with me, but one obvious way to further strengthen the union is for key government departments, such as MOD and DWP, to move more jobs and activities to Scotland. Can you tell the House what he's doing to pursue this particular agenda? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I am a uh, very keen and uh, obviously front uh, cabinet colleagues are present. I'm very keen uh, to ensure as many uh, UK government uh, jobs in, are in Scotland as possible. And I was delighted uh, last week to launch the U- new UK government hub in Edinburgh, which will house 3,000 UK civil servants. Mr Gaffney, get in there, Matt. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Scottish Office, the Scottish Government has launched an independent review into the joint campus of Buchanan and St Ambrose High Schools in my constituency. After health and safety concerns were raised by parents, pupils and staff, would the Secretary of State join me and agree with the concerned parents, pupils and staff that an independent review must properly assess the water quality 
and the site of both schools, including the air and soil contamination for the past, the present and the future of these children. Uh, Mr Speaker, obviously I, uh, it, 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 that matter is ultimately for the Scottish Government, but I know the Honourable Member is a real champion for the parents and pupils at those schools, and I will do everything to assist him uh, in taking forward their concerns. I think they should go in Michael. Number five, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, I continue to work closely with colleagues on the Fisheries Bill, which will allow us to manage our fisheries sustainably and deliver on our promise to take back control of our waters. It will allow us to decide who may fish in our waters and on what terms as we become an independent coastal state. The last time I asked the Secretary of State about the Fisheries Bill, he deflected the question by saying, we will see what happens when the Bill returns on report. That was on the 16th of January, Mr Speaker, five months ago, and we have still not had the Fisheries Bill on report. When are we going to get it? Uh, I am sure that uh, the, uh, the uh, Honourable Gentleman will be here be surprised to hear me say, in due course. Oh, very well done. Colin Clark, number eight, Mr. Speaker. In the Secretary of State. Mr. Speaker, I have regular meetings with my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, on a range of issues relevant to Scotland. This has included discussions about the support that this Government has provided to the oil and gas sector. The UK Government is committed to ensuring this key industry has a long future. Clark. Can I thank him for that? Side? Can I congratulate my right honourable friends and the Scottish Office for supporting Scottish industry when the SNP Scottish Government does not? And it's due to his hard work that transferable tax history was delivered to oil and gas industry. Would he agree with me that the opposition benches suggesting we should divest from the oil and gas industry threatens 120,000 highly paid Scottish jobs? It's into the matter of opposition policy. That would be impure. And I'm sure the right honourable gentleman would never knowingly be impure. The Secretary of State. Mr uh, Speaker, uh, my honourable friend has, since joining this parliament, become a real champion uh, of the industry. And it does disappoint me that we hear uh, members opposite describing oil and gas as a dirty technology with no long-term future. We can be clear this party and this government will always stand up for Scotland's oil. Uh, Mr uh, Speaker, there is currently no legal framework for the provision of drug consumption rooms in the UK. The Scottish Affairs Committee is undertaking an inquiry into drug use in Scotland. As with other inquiries, the Government will consider the Committee's report. I'm sorry, Mr Speaker, that's just not good enough. Yeah. People in my constituency are dying for want of a safe consumption room. Will he come to Glasgow and meet with people in Glasgow to see why this is very much needed to reduce harm and to save lives? Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Hey. Mr Speaker, I hear what the Honourable Lady says, but I, I, I wouldn't have thought that the Honourable Member for Perth and North Perthshire would accept that his committee's inquiry, which I regard as a serious inquiry, which is visiting many uh, overseas examples, is something that we want to take seriously. We want to look at its uh, report, and that's what we'll do. Order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Mr Marcus Jones. Yeah, 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 yeah. Question number one, please, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Mr. Mr Speaker, today marks two years since the terror attack on the Finsbury Park Mosque. It was a truly cowardly and depraved attack that was intended to divide us. Instead, London remained united. And it is London's diverse communities that make London the world's greatest capital city. Mr Speaker, in recent days and weeks, we have seen flooding across the country, which has been particularly severe in Lincolnshire. I know the whole House will want to join me in paying tribute to the work of the emergency services, our military, the Environment Agency, and all those who have been working on the ground to support the communities affected. The Government stands ready to respond and offer all assistance where required. 
Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Marcus Jones. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, I would like to associate myself and the whole House with the comments the Prime Minister has made about the Finsbury Park mosque attack uh, and the flooding uh, in Lincolnshire. Uh, Mr Speaker, if our town centres are to survive and thrive, we need more people living in them, more people working in them and more people spending their leisure time in them. I welcome the Future High Streets Fund and would commend to my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, the bid that has been put in, the important bid, from Neaton, uh, and would ask her if she could speak to her ministers to look on that bid very favourably. Prime Minister! Well, can I say, my, right on, my honourable friend is right to say that uh, high streets are changing and we're committed. we are committed to helping communities adapt, and he set out some of the things he wants to see if we're going to see those high streets continue to thrive. And of course, as he said, we've provided £675 million in the Future High Streets Fund. I'm pleased to hear about the Transforming Nuneaton uh, programme. I understand this aims to increase footfall and drive economic growth. And the bid from Nuneaton for the higher, uh, High Streets Fund is currently under consideration, and we hope to announce the bids that have been successful in going forward to the business case development phase in the summer. Jeremy Corbyn. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today does mark two years since the terrorist attack on Muslim people in Finsbury Park outside the mosque and the murder of my constituent, Makram Ali. With the far right on the rise both in our country and across the world, we can all send a message to all those who seek to sow hatred and division in our society that we will not be divided. Our diversity is our strength and I believe always will be. And I concur with what the Prime Minister said about the need to support people who have suffered from the floods over the weekend and of course the work of the emergency services in helping them. On Friday, I was honoured, Mr Speaker, to join Grenfell residents and survivors to mark two, the two-year anniversary of that terrible tragedy. With great dignity, they are also campaigning for justice and change. Across this House, we have a duty to make sure such fires can never happen again. That is why I have signed up to, and I hope the Prime Minister will, the Never Again campaign run by the Fire Brigade Union with the support of the Daily Mirror. Three years after the Grenfell fire, the Prime Minister said, my government will do whatever it takes to help those affected get justice and keep our people safe. So two years on, why do 328 high-rise buildings, homes to thousands of people from Newham to Newcastle, still have the same Grenfell-style cladding? Prime Minister. I first of all, say to the right honourable gentleman that I absolutely agree with him that we will never be divided and our diversity is indeed our strength and we should all celebrate that diversity. He refers to uh, last Friday being two years on from the terrible tragedy of the Grenfell fire. I was very pleased yesterday to uh, welcome, as part of Green for Grenfell, uh, people from the Grenfell community, Grenfell United and others, to uh, Number 10 Downing Street, particularly young people, and to hear from them their questions and talk to them about their concerns for the future. He refers to the issue of cladding on uh, the Shadow Foreign Secretary. I'm, I'm pleased to see her back from her education, re-education camp of a few weeks ago. Um, she, says, she says, what did I say? And I'm about to tell her and the rest of the House what I said. Just a little patience. Uh, it, w the issue of justice was indeed raised by one of the young people, and that is exactly why, exactly why, within days after the fire, I set up the public inquiry. That, of course, has two phases. It will soon be entering its second phase. We've appointed uh, panel members to sit alongside the judge in that second phase. But the aim of that is to find out exactly what went wrong who was responsible, who was accountable, and enable that justice for the people of, uh, of Grenfell. And he talks about the, uh, the issue of cladding. Of course, we asked building uh, owners in the pr private sector to do the action that we believed was necessary, um, but we have seen they have not been acting quickly enough. 
and that is why we will fully fund the replacement of cladding on high-rise residential buildings, and interim measures are in place where necessary on all 163 high-rise private residential buildings with unsafe ACM cladding. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, obviously the inquiry must go on and we await its response to what actually happened at Grenfell, but the answer she gave is of no comfort to the 60,000 people living in high-rise tower blocks across the country. They are worried. Their communities are worried. And whilst Government funding is, of course, necessary and welcome, but not yet available. More than 70 block owners still have no plan in place to get the work done. So will the Prime Minister set an end of this year deadline for all dangerous cladding to be removed and replaced? Will she toughen up the powers for councils to levy big fines and, where necessary, confiscate blocks to get this vital safety work done where the block owners simply fail to do it? Yes. Can I say to the right honourable gentleman? Minister. As he knows all affected buildings identified in the social sector have been uh, uh, visited by the Fire and Rescue Services to carry out the checks to make sure the interim safety measures are in place, and remediation work has started on or finished on over three quarters of these buildings, and we're fully funding the removal and replacement of unsafe ACM cladding systems on high-rise social housing. He refers to the housing in the private sector. We asked building owners to take the action that was necessary. We expected building owners to take the action that was necessary. Uh, they have not done enough. They have not acted quickly enough. And that's why the government has stepped in. And the government has said that we will fully fund the replacement of cladding on high-rise residential buildings. And as I said, there are interim measures in place until that work is done. Jeremy Corbyn. The question was, will she ensure this is done by the end of of this year. Yes. Under the current, current rate of progress, it will take three years for even the social housing blocks to be done. But the issue goes wider. 1,700 other buildings, including hospitals, care homes, schools and hotels, are clad in other potentially combustible materials. If landlords won't act, will the government step in and act on those buildings as well? The 2013 Coroner's Report into the deadly Lacknell House fire recommended sprinklers should be retrofitted to all social housing. Currently, only 32 out of 837 council tower blocks above 30 metres have sprinklers. Two years after Grenfell, six years after the coroner's report, will the Prime Minister now accept the recommendation and set a deadline for all high-rise blocks to have sprinklers retrofitted? Yeah. Yeah. Can I say, Minister. First of all, he raises the issue of other cladding. And indeed, uh, the work is being done to investigate other cladding and to uh, look at the safety of, uh, of other cladding. Uh, he then talks about the re uh, coroner's report and recommendation in 2013. I think he has, has inadvertently uh, said something that doesn't quite reflect what the coroner's report said. What the coroner's report said was that landlords should consider in, uh, uh, putting in retrofitting sprinklers. It did not say that every building should be retrofitted with, uh, with sprinklers. And of course, as he will know, there are many uh, up and down the country, including Labour councils, who have chosen not to fit sprinklers. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, the coroner's report made it very clear that they thought sprinklers would make blocks safer. I don't think we should be playing around with semantics here. We should be making sure... Make making sure that all the blocks are safe across the whole country. Only 105 of the 673 new-build schools have sprinklers. Under Labour, we would make sure that all new schools have sprinklers fitted. Grenfell survivors say we were victims before the fire. Radical change is needed in our system of social housing. Tenants raise concerns about safety. They were ignored. So two years on from Grenfell, when will we see government legislation to strengthen tenants' rights and apply the Freedom of Information Act to all housing associations as well as local authorities? Prime Minister. First of all, it is absolutely right. One of the aspects of what happened at Grenfell Tower, which I believe is truly shocking, is that residents of that tower 
were raising concerns with the tenant management organisation and the council in a, before the fire happened over a significant period of time, and their voice was not heard. That is why one of the other things that I did after the Grenfell Tower fire was to initiate work looking at social housing for the housing minister, the then housing minister, and this has been taken on by subsequent housing minister, went around the country meeting with people in social housing to see was this something that happened simply at Grenfell or was this something that was happening across the country and how can we strengthen the voice of people who are living in social housing. That is something that uh, uh, I believe should be done. It is something, it's the work that we have been putting in place. It is absolutely right that the voices of those people should have been heard and should have been acted on, and we want to ensure that in future social housing tenants' voices will be heard. Jeremy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, that's all well and good, but just how long does it take to amend the Freedom of Information Act to make sure it applies to social housing run by housing associations as well as local authorities? The Government spent £1,013 million on fire services in 2016-17. This year, it's £858 million, a £155 million cut from fire services. Every fire authority across the country, from the 11% cut in Greater Manchester to 42% in Warwickshire, are going through the same experience. Mr Speaker, you can't put a price on people's lives. You can't keep people safe on the cheap. The Prime Minister told the country at the Conservative Party conference last autumn that austerity is over. Will she now pledge that her government will increase fire service funding and firefighter numbers next year? Yes. Prime Minister. To the right honourable gentleman. That indeed we are able to end austerity, we are able to put more money into public services. The reason we're able to do that is because a Conservative government takes a balanced approach to the economy. We have been putting right the wrongs that were left by a Labour government that left us the largest deficit in our peacetime history. That's the legacy of Labour. We saw fewer people in work, less money to spend on public services, and we won't let it happen again. The legacy of this Tory government is 10,000 firefighter jobs cut since 2010, 40 fire stations closed, including 10 in London under the previous mayor. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister claimed action on Grenfell would be part of her legacy, but in two long years, too little has changed. She has met the Grenfell survivors, I have met the Grenfell survivors. Their pain is real, palpable and continues. A big test for the next Prime Minister will be to make good the failings of this Government over the past two years. A failure to rehouse all the survivors, a failure to give justice to the Grenfell community, a failure to make safe on other dangerous high-rise blocks, a failure to retrofit sprinklers, and a failure to end austerity in the fire service. So does the Prime Minister believe that the time of the third anniversary next year, the Government will be able to honestly say to the country, with conviction, to the Grenfell survivors, never again. Yeah. Prime Minister. The Right Honourable Gentleman refers to the rehousing of the Grenfell survivors. All 201 households have been offered temporary or permanent accommodation. Uh, and 100. I think it's 194 of those households have accepted that and 184 have been able to move into their accommodation. The Right Honourable Gentleman talks about the, the, what the Government has been doing in response to the Grenfell Tower fire. We have set up immediately a, a public inquiry. We set up immediately the Dame Judith Hackett review, which looked at the issues around the building regulations and fire safety, and the Government is acting on the results of that, and I expect a future Government to act on the results of the public inquiry. I have met, I have met, I have met over, on a number of occasions now, as I said, including yesterday, people who survived the Grenfell Tower fire, people who lost their homes, people who lost members of their families, young people who lost their best friends. Their pain is indeed great. It will never go away. It is important for us to ensure that we provide the support for those survivors into the future. It isn't just about buildings and cladding. It's about support for the local community. 
It is about mental health services and support for those who have been affected. This Government is committed to ensuring that we provide that support and to ensuring that we do everything we can to make sure that a tragedy like Grenfell Tower can never happen again. Tim Lawton. Mr Speaker, today is Thank a Teacher Day, and I'm sure the whole House will want to express their gratitude to our hard-working, dedicated uh, teachers. But earlier this week, a report from the DfE showed that children in coastal areas achieve lower grades than elsewhere, which means that children in constituencies like mine have the double whammy, because West Sussex has historically been one of the worst-funded school uh, areas as well. So given the PM recognises that fair funding for schools needs to be a priority in the forthcoming comprehensive spending review. Will she support setting up a coastal schools challenge fund to replicate the success of the London schools challenge fund, which achieves significant improvements in outcomes from 2003 in London? Minister. I say to my honourable friend, first of all, I think we should all recognise Thank a Teacher Day. Uh, I'm sure everybody across this House remembers a particular teacher who had an impact on them and uh, indeed it helped them to do what it was necessary to become a Member of Parliament and to represent a local community in this House. My honourable friend uh, makes a point about coastal communities. He will know that school funding is at a record level uh, and our reforms have been improving education standards. I want to ensure that schools have the resources they need and reform reform uh, continues to improve those standards, that we are able to give schools the budgets on a timetable to work for them, and that we continue, he mentioned this issue of fairer funding, that we continue to make progress on the fairer national funding formula. I think what my hon. Friend has done in referencing a coastal uh, uh, fund for a school, school uh, coastal fund is uh, actually a bid into the spending review that will be coming later in the year. Ian Blackford. And can I associate myself with the remarks of the Prime Minister on the atrocity at the Finsbury Park Mosque? Mr Speaker, this is also World Refugee Week, and I want to commend my honourable friend, the member for Nairland and Yar, who brought forward a family reunion bill some time ago. Will the Prime Minister, in the time that she's got left, please make sure that this comes forward to committee? <laughs> Mr Speaker, does the Prime Minister agree with the front-runner set to succeed her that the Scottish people are a verminous race that should be placed in ghettos and exterminated. Yep. Prime Minister! Can I, can I just say to the right honourable gentleman that the, the Conservative and Unionist Party takes the people of every part of this United Kingdom the contribution from people of every part of this United Kingdom, because that is what makes the United Kingdom the great country it is, and long may Scotland remain part of it. Ian Blackford. Well, of course, Mr Speaker, words matter and actions matter. The man who published those words in his magazine, the Prime Minister thought was fit for the office of our top diplomat, and he hasn't stopped there. He said that Scots should be banned from being Prime Minister, banned from being Prime Minister, Mr Speaker, and that a pound spent in Croydon was worth more than a pound spent in Strathclyde. This is a man who is not fit for office. It has been said, Mr Speaker, the ultimate measure of a person is not where they stand in moments of comfort, but where they stand at times of challenge and controversy. This is a time of challenge, and so I ask does the Prime Minister realise not only is the member racist, he is stoking division in communities and has a record of dishonesty. Does the Prime Minister honestly believe... Oh, order! Uh, order! If the Right Honourable Gentleman is referring to a current member of this House, I don't know whether he is, but if he is, he should... Be extremely careful in the language he uses. He should have notified the member in advance. But I would urge him, I would urge him to weigh his words. Mr Ian Blackford. Oh, and indeed, 
and indeed, uh, and I think it would be much better if, for now, he would withdraw any allegation of racism or uh, against any particular member. I don't think that this is the forum. I don't think it's the right way to behave. Mr. Ian Blackford. Mr. Speaker, I have informed the member, but the member has called Muslim women letterboxes, described African people as having watermelon smiles, and another disgusting slur that I would never dignify by repeating. If that's not racist, Mr. Speaker, I don't know what is. Does the Prime Minister honestly believe that this man is fit for the office of Prime Minister? Yeah, 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 yeah. Prime Minister! Can, can I just say to the Right Honourable Gentleman, he's, he's now been leader of the SNP in this chamber for some time. He's been asking Prime Minister's questions for some time. He might actually understand the purpose of Prime Minister's questions, which is to ask the Prime Minister about the actions of the Government. That is what he should be asking us about. And I can say to the Right Honourable Gentleman, I can say to the Right Honourable Gentleman that I believe I believe any Conservative Prime Minister in the future will be better for Scotland than the Scottish Nationalist Party. Nigel Mills! Thank you, Mr Speaker. Would the Prime Minister agree with the importance of tackling corruption and tax evasion around the world and the key role that knowing who really owns companies plays in that? So would she welcome the announcement today by Jersey, Guernsey and the Isle of Man that they will open their registers in a couple of years' time? Or would she urge our remaining overseas territories to make progress in doing the same? Prime Minister! My, my hon. Friend has raised an important issue. I am very pleased to see the announcement today from Jersey, Guernsey and the Isle of Man. And Indeed, we continue to work with overseas territories to ensure that they do follow those standards and open those, uh, those books so that people can see who is actually owning those companies. Tony or Antony at sea. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Following my visit to the Netherlands two weeks ago with Emma Appleby, I have witnessed firsthand the incompetence of both the Home Office and the Department of Health in delivering medical cannabis with THC, not just CBD, for children with severe epilepsy. History was made exactly one year ago today when Alfie Dingley received a licence for his medication when the Prime Minister looked Hannah Deakin, Alfie's mum, in the eye and promised to right this wrong. Today, will the Prime Minister commit to make it part of her legacy to deliver on her promise, not just to Alfie, but to the many other children that are still suffering? Yeah. Prime Minister! Well, lady, obviously, she's absolutely right that we did uh, look at this whole issue of medical cannabis. That's why we changed the approach that was taken. Obviously, individual cases are desperately difficult, and I think everybody across the House feels with the families and friends of those who are affected. But we have ensured that the law has changed, that specialists doctors can now prescribe cannabis-based products for medicinal use where there is clinical evidence of benefit. I think that is the right thing to do. But I know that my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Health, has been hearing the testimony of families about the barriers they appear to have faced and has asked NHS England to undertake a rapid re-evaluation and address any system barriers to clinically approving prescribing. Scully. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah. Last year, an Ofsted report uh, reveals severe shortcomings with the London Borough of Sutton's uh, Special Education Needs Department. And I've since met with many parents, such as Hayley Harding, who has to report the resort to tribunals to get an appropriate educational health and care plan for their children. A leaked internal report showed that the money is categorically not the issue, as Sutton has one the, the highest per head spends on SEND in the whole of the UK, but it also has one of the highest levels of refusals for EHCB assessments. Can the Prime Minister assure me that Sutton Council will receive all possible assistance from the Government to help them resolve their lack of leadership and mismanagement identified in the Council's own report so we don't let families down? Well, my honourable friend has raised a very important issue, and it's vital that all children with special educational needs do receive the support that they need. I've been assured the Council will receive the right support. The DfE and NHS England have been working closely with the local authority to ensure the necessary changes to take place, and will continue to do so. But as my honourable friend has said, actually uh, uh, talked about funding, this year's Sutton's high needs funding has gone up. His allocation has been increased. 
I understand that Ofsted and the CQC will revisit Sutton to ensure the Council is improving its support for children with special educational needs so that those children can indeed fulfil their potential. Diana Johnson. Last month, the Prime Minister wrote to the seven Westminster political leaders and said that the victims of the contaminated blood scandal would have to wait years until the end of the inquiry for compensation to be paid. This is a political decision. Every 96 hours, a victim dies. <laughs> I think the Prime Minister, in her legacy, whilst accepting that she's made the right choice in setting up the inquiry, the, the real legacy would be to pay compensation now, as happened in the Republic of Ireland in the 1990s, for those who've suffered for so much for so long at the hands of the state. I uh, say to the Honourable Lady, who has obviously campaigned long and hard on this issue and championed the needs of all those who were affected, um, it is important, obviously, that victims and their families have they've suffered so much, it's important they get the answers and justice they deserve, and they've been waiting decades for that. In April, as the Honourable Lady will know, the DHS... Uh, C announced a major up uplift in financial support available to beneficiaries of the infected blood support scheme in England, and there are now discussions underway between officials in uh, the UK, Scottish, Welsh and Northern Ireland administrations to look at a matter of urgency how we can provide greater parity of support across the UK. Mr Kenneth Clark. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Conservative Party has frequently won the trust of the public over recent uh, generations because of its reputation for economic competence and responsibility. And th th those qualities have helped to contribute to the Prime Minister's legacy, which you leave behind, of recovery from economic crisis to full employment and economic growth. Uh, does the Prime Minister therefore agree with me that in the present uncertainty surrounding Brexit and the change of government, it would be extremely unwise for candidates in the leadership election or for the outgoing government to start making reckless commitments to tax cuts and spending promises which should properly be addressed responsibly in a spending round once the uncertainties are behind us. Prime Minister! First of all, first of all, can I commend my right honourable and learned friend for the work that he did in a previous Conservative administration as Chancellor of the Exchequer. He left a golden economic legacy which was then completely squandered by 13 years of Labour in government. And, as he says, we have had, Conservatives have had to turn that around, and I'm pleased that we see employment at record levels. I'm pleased that we see the deficit down. I'm pleased that we see debt falling. And uh, we are able to ensure that we are, can put more money into public services. We've already committed that biggest ever cash boost in its history for the National Health Service. And I can assure my right honourable friend uh, that in my time as Prime Minister, we will not make any reckless commitments, but we do want to ensure that we see our public services supported as they should be to provide the services that we believe they sh the, the people of this country deserve. Mr. Varendra Sharma. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Over the last nine years, the Prime Minister has held authority over immigration, first as Home Secretary and now as Prime Minister. By her own metric, she has failed to reduce immigration and her unjust, discriminatory, and racist policies have caused thousands of people to be treated inhumanly. In this refugee week and the last weeks of her term in office, can she call her record on immigration anything other than a failure? Prime Minister! Can I say to the Honourable Gentleman, can I say to the Honourable Gentleman that immigration has been good for this country? But what people want to know is that the government can make decisions about who should come to the country, that there is control on the numbers of people coming to the country, and that the government takes action against those who are here illegally. That has been the purpose of the policy that has been pursued since 2010, giving people confidence, confidence in our immigration system, confidence in our immigration system, so that we can ensure that people will well continue to welcome immigrants into this country who give such an important contribution to our life. Nigel Adams. Uh, Mr Speaker, as we build the homes that we, we need across the country, it's essential that we equip 
young people with the correct practical skills to drive forward our economy. Now, the 45th World Skills Competition takes place in Russia this August, and my constituent, 21 year old Lewis Greenwood, will be representing the UK in the bricklaying competition. Will the Prime Minister wish Lewis and the rest of Team UK the best of British in these Skills Olympics? It is absolutely right to uh, reference the fact that we need those skills uh, for, the, uh, for our economy, for our society in the future. And I'm very happy, first of all, to congratulate Lewis on being the UK representative in the bricklaying competition, in that skills uh, competition in Russia, and wish him all the very best. And I'm sure the whole House will wish him all the very best as he carries the UK standard with him. It's always said that Winston Churchill was a 60 bricks an hour man, a very good bricklayer himself, I must advise the House. Deirdre Brock. Speaker, at the end of her career, will the Prime Minister take time to reflect that her creation of the hostile environment led to the Windrush scandal, to a catalogue of errors in immigration decisions, to people feeling unsafe in their own homes, to an atmosphere of distrust and suspicion, and to xenophobia which has damaged our relations with our European neighbours. Will she apologise for that? Prime Minister! Can I first... Can I first of all can I first of all say to the Honourable Lady, because we do mark Windrush Day on June the 22nd. That is a day that has been set up to recognise the contribution that the Windrush generation made to our life, our society and uh, our economy here in the UK. Uh, what lay behind the issue in relation to the problems that some members of the Windrush generation have, have faced was the fact that when they came into the UK they were not given documentary evidence of their immigration status, and as their countries gained uh, gained independence, they were not given that uh, documentary evidence of their status. That is, it's no good the Honourable Lady shouting rubbish. That That is what lay behind and there were cases of people in the Windrush generation. Order, this is very unseemly behaviour. Members are entitled to ask orderly questions, but having asked the questions, they should then have the courtesy to listen to the Prime Minister's answer. The Prime Minister. Thank you, Mr Speaker. That is what lay at the heart of the issue in relation to the Windrush generation. And it is the case that there were people in the Windrush generation who faced these difficulties as a result of not having that documentary evidence under both Labour governments in the past and, more recently, under this government. The Home Office is working to put that right, and uh, people who are concerned about this should contact the Home Office Task Force, and they will get the help and support that they need. Andrew Griffiths. Mr Speaker, Mr. Speaker last week we learned that a 13-year-old boy who brought his rapist to court received £20 in compensation. A 13-year-old girl and a 15-year-old girl received £50 for being abused as children. Will the Prime Minister agree that this is a terrible way to treat the victims of child sexual abuse, that they deserve to be treated fairly and compassionately, and that it sends out all the wrong signals to anybody who is thinking of bringing their perpetrator to uh, justice? Will she agree with me that it takes huge courage to bring a case like that? And will she urgently look at a review of the criminal compensation orders so that victims of child sexual abuse get the justice they deserve? Minister! Can I I say to my honourable friend, I absolutely agree with him that it takes huge huge courage to come forward to talk about uh, incidents of child sexual abuse and to not just to talk about that, but to be able to go through that such that somebody can be brought to justice as the perpetrator of that abuse. And I commend uh, those who he has spoken about specifically, but all those who come forward to do that. And I, I want to ensure, and I hope that from the action this government has taken through setting up the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse uh, and make it very clear that we want these wrongs to be righted. We want people to be able to feel that they can find justice. The memory will never go. Uh, the memory will last, will live with them but we can at least give them justice. And I urge everybody to come forward 
uh, if they have been subject to child sexual abuse such that justice can be brought. Alex Cunningham. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I am dealing with the most traumatic of constituency cases affecting a vulnerable young woman refugee now at risk of prostitution and trafficking here in the UK. She faces being thrown out in the streets by this government who have refused her the support she desperately needs, even though she has a further challenge submitted to the Asylum Support Tribunal. Will the Prime Minister please show her some compassion? The, the Prime Minister raised a very specific case, and obviously I haven't seen the details of that case, but I will ensure that the Home Secretary looks at the details of that case. Gordon Henderson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, police officers and firefighters are able to retire at 60. However, prison officers cannot retire until they are 66 and are facing the prospect of having to retire at 68. Does my right hon. Friend believe that that is fair? Prime Minister. My, my hon. Friend has raised an important issue, uh, and uh, obviously this is something that I think has been uh, looked at and considered in the past, but I will make sure that the Ministry of Justice are aware of his concerns. Dr Paul Williams. Um, Mr Speaker, my community does not feel safe. Crime rates in Stockton South have almost doubled in the last eight years, while Cleveland Police have lost 500 officers. Now her Home Secretary is admitting that we don't have nearly enough police to be able to keep people safe. So does she now think that she might have been wrong to have made such deep cuts to policing? And would she consider, as her final act as Prime Minister, giving Cleveland Police our 500 bobbies back. Prime Minister! We uh, we have made around £1 billion extra available to these police forces this year. That includes an increase in funding for Cleveland Police. How that money is spent is a matter for the Police and Crime Commissioners and the Chief Constable. We have made funding available and we have ensured that we are giving the police the powers that they need. And, uh, and sadly, the Labour Party in opposition voted against that extra funding for the police. Dr Caroline Johnson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, losing a child is every pa- parent's worst nightmare. But up and down the country every day, parents are caring for children with life-limiting illnesses. For these families, the Children's Hospice and Palliative Care Services are a necessary lifeline. But some of our hospice services are struggling for cash, and indeed Acorns, our largest service, has had to announce the closure of a hospice. Prime Minister, you came to power saying you would help those who are just about managing, but many of these families are barely coping at all. Please, as your legacy, can you give the £40 million needed to provide really good palliative care children's services to all children who need it in this country? Prime Minister. Can I say to the Honourable Lady that I recognise the important role that hospices play generally, but also children's hospices particularly, and I have been pleased to be involved with the establishment of the Alexander Devine Hospice in my own constituency, uh, which was set up after a family tragically lost their son Alexander. Um, It is important that we do uh, ensure that people get the support they need as they are seeing a child approaching the end of their life. We have made children's palliative and end-of-life care a priority in the NHS long-term plan, and over f- the next five years the NHS will be match-funding CCGs who commit to increase their investment in local children's palliative and end-of-life care services by up to £7 million, and that is increasing the support uh, up to a total of £25 million a year by 2023-24. These children and their families do deserve the very best care, and I would commend all who are working in the hospice movement because they provide wonderful end-of-life care for children and adults. Mike Hill. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Hartlepool Hartlepool is a trial area for universal credits, and now we have seven food banks. Is this a legacy the Prime Minister can be proud of? I say to the uh, Honourable Gentleman, nobody wants to see somebody feeling the need to go to a food bank. But what Universal Credit, what Universal Credit does do, what Universal Credit does do, is ensure that people are helped to get into work, and that work. 
pays, as they earn more, they are able to keep more of that uh, of those earnings. And uh, work is the best route out of poverty. And universal credit is working to ensure that people get into work and can provide for themselves and their families. James Gray. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the whole House will, I know, join the Prime Minister in thanking the emergency services and the armed services when they step up to the mark in times of national or local emergency, like the mosque outrage or indeed the Novichok incident in Salisbury near my own constituency. But will she also do what she's done throughout her time as Prime Minister and pay tribute to a vast army of other people, the volunteers in our society who do so much for us, I think particularly of the Royal British Legion, the Royal National Lifeboat Institution, the Red Cross, and particularly this important day in their life, the Order St John and the St John Ambulance Brigade. These are truly the big society. My my honourable friend is absolutely right. So much of what happens in our country, so much that is good in our country, does indeed depend on volunteers up and down the country and the the organisations my honourable friend has referenced and in other community groups and other charities too. We should celebrate the work that volunteers do. We should commend them for their work and most of all we should say a wholehearted thank you. Vicky Foxcroft. A high score of adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, increases an individual's chances of having physical health issues, poor mental health, or being involved in violence. Today, the Wave Trust will be sending out a survey to anonymously collate MPs' ACEs score. This is the first time this has ever been attempted by any national parliament. So will the Prime Minister, like me, fill in the survey and encourage other colleagues to do the same. The Prime Minister. She raises an important point about the impact that adverse childhood experiences can have on children in their later life. Um, It's one of the reasons why we are are putting uh, so much support and emphasis on mental health of young people to help them uh, as they are going through their life. I I wasn't aware of this survey. I'm happy to to look at that survey, and uh, I'm sure all members of the the House will look at it and recognise the importance of this information, that this information can... In, uh, increase knowledge of these adverse childhood experiences and help to deal with these issues. David Dukit. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My right old friend will be aware that there are already almost 400,000 people employed in the low carbon sector and its supply chains across the country. But can she assure me that more jobs will be created in this industry throughout our modern, through our modern industrial strategy, including in cap- cap- carbon capture, utilisation, and storage, which will be critical to meet our net zero targets? Yep. Yes. Well, can I say to uh, my honourable friend, uh, absolutely, I can give him the assurance that as we look to meet our climate change target, we will indeed see more jobs being created in this uh, in this sector. And I was very pleased when I made the announcement about the net zero emissions target to visit Imperial College here in London, but. Where they are doing uh, important research and training work on carbon capture and storage, which will be of benefit across this country and actually across the world as well. Mary Cray. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister is a dedicated follower of fashion, so can she explain why yesterday her government rejected a penny on every garment sold in this country, which would have created green jobs? a ban on the 300,000 tonnes of textiles that go to landfill or incineration, and the 16 other recommendations made by my committee when she wants to get to a net zero carbon economy by 2050. Prime Minister. I say to the Honourable Lady, I'm aware of the report from the Environment Audit Committee on this issue. Much that the Committee wants to achieve is actually already covered by government policy. And there are a number of areas I could uh, say. For example, making producers responsible for the full cost of managing and disposing of their products after they are no longer useful. And last week, the government opened a multi-million pound grant scheme to help boost the recycling of textiles and plastic packaging. We have already uh, responded to many of the issues that were raised by that report. Giles Watling. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Now, unlike local councils, NHS bodies are not legally required to balance their budget on an annual basis. Cambridgeshire and Peterborough STP is facing a deficit of £192 million, and other STPs could be raided to bail them out. So what would my right honourable friend say to my constituents, including those in places like Jaywick, an area of deprivation and that has extensive health inequalities, when they ask me why their services should suffer to meet the deficits of others? Can I say to my honourable friend that, of course, we want to ensure that all 
health uh, uh, trusts, all health services, are indeed operating, operating properly within their budgets and are able to balance their, uh, balance their books. But I, what I would say to uh, his constituents is that I am pleased that this Government has been able to increase the funding that is available to the National Health Service, and that will go towards increasing and improving the services that his constituents are able to receive. James. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. The Prime Minister is a busy woman. She might not have seen the latest report from Inside Housing. Inside Housing have revealed that three successive ministers were written to over a total of 21 times over four years by the all-party group on fire safety, urging them to act to make sure we avoid another fire following the Lacanau House fire. The last of those 21 letters was written a month before the Grenfell Tower fire. No action was taken. What does the Prime Minister believe those ministers should have done when they received that expert advice? Yeah. Minister. I say, ministers obviously always look very carefully at the expert advice that they receive, but the whole question of what has happened and the advice that was available is a matter that will be looked at in the second phase of the public inquiry. Yeah, yeah. Well, through. Yeah, yeah. Later yeah. today in Westminster Hall, members would have the opportunity to debate the independent review of the Modern Slavery Act. Thanks to the leadership of my radical friend, this landmark piece of legislation has empowered both victims and the police to seek justice, with 239 suspects charged and 185 people convicted of modern slavery offences in 2007-1718. Could my radical friend outline what further measures she believes would help to strengthen this Act? Well, I'm, I'm pleased that my honourable friend has raised this issue because I think this is an important. Uh, it, it remains an important topic. We've seen not only the first convictions under the Act, but also thousands of businesses publishing transparency statements, senior business leaders being much more engaged on the issue than ever before. Um, we'll shortly be published. You asked what more we'll be doing. We will shortly be publishing a consultation to look at ways to strengthen transparency in supply chains, and we're expanding transparency laws to cover the public sector and its purchasing power. This is very important. The public sector has huge purchasing power, and this could be used to good cause to ensure that we are ending modern slavery. Anna Subri. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister is keen to secure a legacy of acting in the country's very best interests. So will she commit to introducing legislation that will guarantee that this House sits in September and in October so that in the event of a no-deal Brexit, all options are available to this Parliament, including revoking Article 15. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, the dates for recess and times for sitting for this House will be uh, uh, published to this House in due course. Brian. Um, the national funding formula for schools is great for underfunded constituencies like mine, and funding is going up twice as fast as the national average. But village schools and small schools are still under financial pressure, and their numbers have declined over recent decades. Will my right honourable friend encourage the DfE to look again at how we can make the national funding formula do more to help village schools, which are so important to our rural life? Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, first of all, can I say to my honourable friend that I absolutely ex accept and recognise the important role that village schools play in our rural life. Uh, a lot of work went into the national funding formula. I think it is right that we are introducing this fairer uh, means of, uh, of funding. And we have yet, of course, to reach the end point of the national funding formula. Uh, but I want to see us progressing and ensuring that we are putting that national funding formula uh, in place. But I'm sure that the Secretary of State for Education will have heard the particular request that my honourable friend has made. Dr. Rosanna Allen Khan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am heartbroken, and Tooting is heartbroken. On Friday night, the streets claimed another victim. And Shayon Evans may to this government be another awkward statistic. But to us, he was a son, a brother, a friend taken too soon. This senseless violence could have been avoided with adequate policing, good youth provision, and giving our young people a sense of hope. So my question, Prime Minister, is simple. Will the Prime Minister use her remaining days in office to leave a legacy which will change the paths for these young people, or can we expect yet more of the same? First of all, can I say to the Honourable Lady, none of us ever wants to see a life, or particularly a young life, taken before its time by violent crime. These are not difficult statistics. They are people who had a future ahead of them and who have, found them, have 
sadly died and been the result of the violence of criminal perpetrators. We, are, we, have introduced, we have introduced our serious violence strategy. We are working with the police and with other organisations to ensure that young people are turned away from the use of violence, that they are turned away from the use of knives. This is not just a question. She puts it as a question of funding and police numbers. Actually, it's a much wider issue. Anybody who denies that this is a wider issue for our society is simply failing to understand the issue we have to address. And if she wants to talk to somebody about the police on the streets of London, I suggest she talks to the Mayor of London. Dr Julian Lewis! Bearing the subjudice rule firmly in mind, what does the Prime Minister think of the principle of bringing a dying, decorated former soldier before the courts of Northern Ireland on charges based on no new evidence which are unlikely ever to lead to a conviction? Can I, can I say to my honourable friend um, that I know this is an issue that he and a number of other right honourable and honourable friends have raised in terms of individual cases and the general principle. None of us want to see elderly veterans being brought before the courts uh, in the way that he has described. But what we do need to ensure is that we have a processes and systems in Northern Ireland that ensure that proper investigation is taking place. Unfortunately, and I can understand that my colleagues feel that the state has let people like the veteran that he quoted, my old friend quoted, down. But the fact is that previous investigations have not been found to be lawful, and that is why we are having to look at the process of investigation. Uh, I have said many times, standing at this dispatch box, I want to ensure that we see the terrorists who cause the vast majority of deaths in Northern Ireland being properly brought to justice. That is what we are working on, and we will continue to work on a system that is fair. Neil Gray. Mr Speaker, um, when the Prime Minister uh, took office as Prime Minister, she suggested that it would be her mission to tackle burning injustices. And yet, this morning, uh, the report from the IFS, commissioned by the Joseph Rowntree Foundation, shows that under the cabinets that she has served in over the last nine years, in-work poverty has risen dramatically. Won't that be the legacy of her premiership? Uh, well, he's raised the IFS report. In fact, what the IFS report showed was that uh, people in work are better off. People are better off when they move into work. It showed that under this government, under this government, more people are work than ever before. That material deprivation rates have down, fallen by a fifth since 2010. And it showed, it showed that the reason for the relative poverty figures is that pensioners are better off. The honourable gentleman might think cutting pensioners' incomes in the answers is the answer. Actually, I don't. Order. Yes, we'll come to points of order. Point of order, Mr. Bill Wiggin. I'm most grateful, Mr. Speaker. Since you took the chair, sir, you have been a stalwart defender of backbenchers. You have also stood up to bad parliamentary behaviour, like the use of the word racism. I am deeply upset that your chairmanship has been undermined dramatically because of the very calm and polite advice you gave to honourable members, leaders of political parties in this House, that was ignored. Please, will you do all you can to make sure that words like racist are not common parlance in this House? Yeah. Well, I'm very grateful to the honourable gentleman for his point of order, and I'm always appreciative of kind words, and insofar as the honourable gentleman is proffering sympathy for me and expressing concern about my reputation, I'm deeply obliged to him, but, you know, I'm, I'm not a delicate flower and I don't feel any concern on that front. I'm simply trying to do the right thing by the House. There was originally, as colleagues of long service will know, a list 
of unparliamentary words. That list was discontinued, not least on account of its potentially infinite scope. It was therefore discontinued. And the word in question is not of itself unparliamentary. The issue is to judge context and to make an assessment of what is seemly in the chamber. And I made my own assessment and I advised the House accordingly and indeed the right honourable gentleman. It was only when I heard the full flow of the words that I was able to make an assessment and I think it would be wise for colleagues to bear in mind the general principle that one does not impute dishonour to another member. That is the first point. And the second point is, I know that there is a degree of latitude in respect of questions to the Prime Minister, but I think it would be appropriate in the remaining weeks before the summer recess and before a new leader of the governing party takes office to have some regard to that for which the Prime Minister is responsible. Here, here. The Prime Minister is responsible for her own policies and the conduct of her government and its administration of affairs, and it is important that questions should be put with that overarching consideration and ambit of responsibility in mind. However, I've said what I've said. The Right Honourable Gentleman has made his point in his question, and I have no wish to prolong the argument. And knowing what a naturally good-natured fellow the Honourable Gentleman is, I feel sure that he has no such ambition either. We'll leave it there for now. We come, uh, and I thank the Honourable Gentleman, we come to the statement by the Economic Secretary to the Treasury, Economic Secretary John Glenn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And with permission, I should like to make a statement on supporting people in problem debt to the House. This is an issue that is very close to my heart as a former member of the all-party parliamentary group for hunger and food poverty. I've seen firsthand the hardship that problem debt can cause. And now that I'm in a position to bring about change, I'm very focused on improving the lives of the most disadvantaged. Problem debt places a heavy burden on households and can lead to family breakdown, stress and mental health issues. Mr Speaker, the Government has taken steps to prevent problem debt from occurring and to support those who have fallen into it. We have reformed the regulation of consumer credit, we have widened access to professional debt advice and are helping to build individual financial capability. And today I can update the House on the Government's plans to go further with the introduction of a breathing space and a statutory debt repayment plan. I am very grateful for the support of my honourable friend for Rochester and Stroud, whose private members' bill and ongoing work has made a key contribution to this becoming Government policy. For people who are just getting by, even a small income shock can provoke a cycle of debt dependence which can be difficult to escape from. If then faced with invasive debt enforcement, it is no wonder that many people in problem debt simply disengage. The first step to countering problem debt is to ensure that consumer credit firms are properly regulated. Loans should not be made to people who cannot afford to repay them. And the Government has empowered the Financial Conduct Authority to ensure that firms lend responsibly, protecting consumers from overborrowing. And at Budget 2018, the Government announced new measures to increase access to affordable credit by helping foster a larger, more vibrant social lending sector. In parallel, we have put in place support to help people make good financial decisions. The new Money and Pensions Service brings together three existing publicly funded money and pensions guidance services into one new organisation, providing free support and guidance on all aspects of people's financial lives. Importantly, 
It also has a statutory duty to develop and coordinate a national strategy to improve people's financial capability. But despite these preventative measures, I recognise that many still fall into problem debt. For these people, further support is required. Seeking professional advice is a vital step in moving towards a sustainable debt solution. And that is why we have increased public funding for free professional debt advice to almost £56 million this year, delivering 560 sessions in England. But more needs to be done. The Money and Pensions Service estimate that there are up to 9 million over-indebted people in the UK but only a fraction access free debt advice each year. And that is why today, following consultation, I can announce how the Government will deliver its manifesto commitment to introduce a breathing space scheme for people in problem debt. Mr Speaker, the scheme has two parts, which together will protect debtors from creditor action, help them get professional advice on their debt problems, and help them pay off their debts in a sustainable way. Breathing space will provide debtors with a 60-day period where interest and charges on their debts are frozen and enforcement action from creditors is paused. Creditors must not start new court action. Communication with debtors relating to enforcement of their debt must stop, and benefit reductions to reclaim debt will pause. During this time, debtors will have to seek professional debt advice to find a sustainable solution to their debt problem. And, Mr Speaker, these protections will encourage people in problem debt to seek advice earlier and give them the headspace to identify the right debt solution for them. The statutory debt repayment plan is a new debt solution which extends the breathing space protections to debtors who commit to fully repaying their debts to a manageable timeline. Importantly, these payment plans will be flexible to, to changes in debtors' life circumstances to remain sustainable over the long term. So if their disposable income decreases, their payments will go down and vice versa. The Breathing Space Scheme will make a real difference to the most vulnerable families across this country, and I recognise the sense of urgency across the House to deliver this policy quickly. So I'm committed to delivering the scheme swiftly, working closely with key stakeholders to make sure it works in practice. The Government will lay regulations on the breathing space element of the policy before the end of the year and intend to implement them as soon as possible, as early in 2021. We will continue to develop the statutory debt repayment plan in a slightly longer timetable. In addition, I am pleased to announce that the Government will go beyond its manifesto commitment in two areas. As many of us have heard in our constituencies, people's experience of problem debt is changing. And as I have seen firsthand, it is wrong to assume that over-indebtedness is simply a product of taking out too much credit. Many people struggle to meet essential bills and can end up owing money to multiple creditors in the public and private sectors. So for this policy to be successful, it must properly reflect the issues debtors are dealing with. So I can announce today that the Breathing Space Scheme will cover a broad range of debts. It will cover not just financial services debts, but arrears owed to utility companies and to central and local government. Council tax arrears, personal tax debts and benefit overpayments will be included amongst others. And this broad protection will make the policy effective for debtors and fair to creditors. The House will recognise the strong links also between mental health issues and problem debt. Sadly, up to 23,000 people in England each year struggle with problem debt whilst in hospital because of mental health issues. And the Breathing Space Scheme must work for everyone facing problem debt. In particular, it must be open to the most vulnerable in society. So to that end, I can confirm that people receiving treatment for mental health crisis can enter breathing space without seeking advice from a debt advisor, which could be a significant barrier for many. And these protections will last the entirety of an individual's crisis treatment, followed by a further 30 days to allow them to get back on their feet and decide whether they wish to enter the main breathing space scheme or work out another solution for their debts. 
And given mental health issues are often recurring, there will be no limit to the number of times an individual can enter via this mechanism. And I would like to thank the honourable members for Liverpool Wavertree and North Norfolk, and my honourable friend, the member for Plymouth Moorview, for their dedicated work on this issue, and to the Money and Mental Health Policy Institute for raising this important issue. So, Mr Speaker, millions of people struggle with problem debt and the burdens it brings. The Government has committed to helping these people take control of their finances and get back on a stable financial footing. The breathing space scheme that I have described today will help fulfil this commitment, and I commend it to the House. Jonathan Reynolds. Mr Speaker, can I begin by thanking the Minister for his courtesy in giving me advance notice of this statement being made today, and to say this is a statement which we broadly welcome. For some time, I believe there has been a growing consensus that there is a need for something which is less dramatic than formal insolvency proceedings, but which does offer hope to people with problem debts that there can be a way out of them. And that's what the Breathing Space Scheme should be, a space to let people get back on their feet, perhaps overcoming a health issue or a period of unemployment or something else which has adversely affected their lives. There will always be disagreement between ourselves and the government on the necessity of the austerity policies which have blighted this country since 2010. Mm -hmm. But no one can deny that household debt in the UK is large, it's growing, and for many people it is problematic. The big change I've seen in my own constituency is people not just using credit to buy a car or a new sofa or a washing machine, but using short-term credit to pay their living costs at the end of the month for food, dinner money, and for children's clothes. And the worst is when people Unable to take control of their own affairs, go from one short-term credit product to another, compounding the costs and liabilities that they're incurring, sometimes ending up in hock to illegal money lenders as the only option that they have left. Mr Speaker, one of my constituents ended up suicidal as a result of a story like that. So we want this policy to work. And the questions I have for the Minister today are in that spirit, of making sure we get a policy that works. So firstly, can I ask him, about the time period that has been selected. Can he say why 60 days has been chosen as optimal? Going back to the point about the need to let people overcome whatever problem they have faced, I have always felt that that period may need to be longer. Secondly, can I ask him to confirm my understanding of what he said just now in his statement, which is that all debts will be covered, including public sector debts like council tax arrears and benefit overpayments? Mr Speaker, I very much recognise the obliteration of local government finances over the last nine years. And I actually presented a petition alongside colleagues to Downing Street this morning regarding just how bad those have been for councils like mine in Thameside. But council tax arrears are one of the biggest causes of the bailiffs being called, and we need them included too. In addition, can I also ask the Minister to look specifically at the issue of guarantor loans? These are loans where another person, typically a family member, accepts joint liability for the debt. I had another case of this type from a constituent in Staley Bridge just this week. If the breathing space period didn't apply to these loans, the burden would simply pass and offer no relief, and that would be counterproductive. Ultimately, Mr Speaker, this policy will only work if there are sufficient sources of advice and support for people to access during the breathing space period. And it is a reality to say that those services, Citizens Advice Bureau, local authority and housing association advice centres and so on, have been put under massive strain over the last few years. So what strategy has the government got to significantly improve the capacity in this area? Because whatever initiatives have been pursued today, whatever merit they have, there is no doubt that we do need to go further. Finally, in the famous words of Archbishop Desmond Tutu, there comes a point where we need to stop just pulling people out of the river, but to go upstream and find out why they're falling in. As well as a change of economic policy, we believe it's time to regulate further the interest that can be charged on overdrafts and credit cards, to look at the marketing of credit to vulnerable people, and to ensure there is real and effective financial education in schools. There is a lot to do. This statement is a move in the right direction today. But let's make sure we keep going in that direction. Well, I'd like to thank the Honourable Gentleman for his uh, 
typically positive and constructive remarks, and uh, I will try and address the, I think, five key points that he, he raised. Um, the first one was about the definition of the time period being 60 days. Um, this was longer than the manifesto commitment that we had to six weeks. It was the product of listening to the consultation uh, responses, listening to the experience of the mechanism in Scotland, um, and it was actually what was uh, seen as overall the right solution. He then asked about uh, what's included in terms of debts. I tried to set out that it was extremely broad, uh, covering public sector debts um, and arrears. He asked about bailiffs and their role. Of course, the Ministry of Justice uh, completed a uh, consultation exercise in February and will respond in due course. There is guidance uh, on, from, on fairness of debt collection from the Cabinet Office, but that response um, from the MOJ will, will, will happen in due course, but he makes a very reasonable point on that. Thirdly, he asked about guarantor loans, which is one uh, emerging new category of high-cost credit. And these are matters that are regulated by the FCA. But I was in conversation just this morning with the chairman of the FCA, and I was speaking to Andrew Bailey, the chief executive, earlier this week about the need to be vigilant across all emerging forms of high-cost credit, and that is something that you know, is on, under ongoing review. Fourthly, he asked about uh, capacity, uh, capability in the uh, area of uh, debt advice. Now, the creation of the Money and Pension Service as a new single entity will, I uh, envisage, bring much better coordination around advice that's available. As I mentioned in my opening uh, statement, uh, government spent £56 million last year. Uh, an additional 85,000 people were seen on the previous year. Um, and we are looking at ways how that advice can become consistently of a higher standard. Finally, he asked about long-term causes and the regulation of uh, and marketing of uh, high-cost credit products. Following a, the recent um, issues around London capital and finance, I directed the FCA, uh, and very cooperatively with them, to uh, undertake some examination of what happened there. And I've asked my officials also in the Treasury to conduct a separate re review over the way that regulation works. Uh, we have got to continue to be vigilant about the evolving space where increased digitalisation of availability of uh, high-cost credit means that the regulation and oversight needs to keep a pace with that. I hope that answers his questions. Dame Caroline Spellman. Mr Speaker, I welcome this statement and the Government going beyond its original manifesto commitment. And it gives me a chance to record my thanks to the Citizens Advice Bureau do fantastic work with debt rescheduling during my 22 years as an MP. But I wonder if he would welcome the initiative of the Church of England to teach financial literacy in its primary schools and encourage such an approach to prevention to be rolled out more widely. Well, I very much welcome uh, my right honourable friend's uh, observations around the Church of England's uh, interventions on financial literacy. I think that the ongoing challenge is to develop um, national consistency of delivery of financial education and advice. There are a number of initiatives underway, and the other one is actually try to try and get the financial services providers, particularly the banks, to work in a more coordinated way. But I'm happy to endorse the work of the Church of England, who have been a significant partner in improving financial literacy across this country. Kirsty Blackman. Mr. Speaker. Mr Speaker, I'm really pleased that the UK Government has decided to put this in place and is setting forth the, the mechanism for doing so. In Scotland, we've got the debt arrangement scheme that was launched in 2004 and was reformed significantly in 2011, and that includes a breathing space built into the scheme. Uh, since the reforms in Scotland, over £200 million of debt has been repaid, and 6,000 people have completed a debt payment plan between 2011 and 2018. So I'm pleased to see, in, in particularly the consultation response that the government published today, the public policy response, that the government has looked at the system in Scotland and has t learned lessons here, and, here. Um, and looked at the way that that's, that's worked. Mm -hmm. um, it is clear from this that where the Scottish system has got the powers to do so, then we've got the ability to, to trailblaze and lead the way in these regards. 
Um, because of the debt arrangement scheme that we've had in Scotland, in 2016 we had the lowest proportion of people who were overly indebted in any part of the UK. Um, but Mr Speaker, as austerity continues on, we continue to see the increases in the number of people who are suffering under the burden of, of debt. In 2017, there were 2.4 million children living in families with problem debt in England and Wales. Um, and Step Change Debt have said that 60% of those in problem debt fall into this because of an unexpected life event, not because of the poor, poor money management, because if something external has happened to, to change their lives, it means that they can no longer manage the debt that they have. What I'm concerned about is why it will take the government so long to implement um, the changes that are coming through in this regard. Surely, as most of the creditors uh, already deal with a similar system in Scotland, they should be able to take on the changes fairly quickly and to roll that out over a, over a wider group of people, and they should be able to do that. Is it the case that this could be done any quicker than, I think the date is 2021 in the um, papers I've seen? I thank the Honourable Lady for her observations, and she's quite right. The Government have listened very carefully to the experience and observed very carefully the experience in Scotland. Um, she asks about the timeline. Um, you know, I have done everything I can to move this forward as quickly as possible. There is a challenge to actually bring the sector uh, along at the same pace to ensure that we've got complete commitment and sign up to the processes so that it will be a success. And I'm pleased that the CEO of Step Change Charity has said that he's particularly pleased to see the government's confirmation that debts owed to government itself will be included in the scheme. We've worked very carefully, but this is the timeline that we have to work to. Fiona Bruce. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Mr yeah. Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for these proposals, which will help some of the most vulnerable and their families, and, I believe, save lives. Uh, yep. Could he clarify which stakeholders he will engage with to ensure effective implementation? And will this include debt advice charities like CAP, which does such excellent work in this field? Minister. Well, my honourable friend is very right to to draw attention to the excellent work of Christians Against Poverty, who are indeed a key stakeholder. And we engage very widely with the sector, including the Money and Mental Health Policy Institute, Step Change, as I mentioned, and also the Money Advice Trust and the charity, the National Debt Helpline. It's real, really a collaborative effort, and I'm very pleased with their responses to where we've got to. Me. Uh, Mr Speaker, debt ruins lives. Debt harms health. Debt damages relationships. Debt holds back children, and in extreme circumstances, debt can kill. When we took through the bill last year to establish the Money and Pension Service, the Government gave a commitment that it would move on a breathing space scheme. Today's announcement, therefore, is welcome, in particular in respect of the action taken to defend the interests of those suffering from mental ill health. Uh, in welcoming today's announcement, can I urge at the next stages both that the new arrangements are properly resourced on the one hand and a sense of urgency, the sooner the better that we can see these new arrangements put in place, relieving that terrible burden that afflicts so many people suffering from debt in our country. I am extremely grateful to the Honourable Gentleman's comments. Who, he played a significant role in the passage of this legislation that has led today's announcement. He urges me once again on the point of the time frame for this. And, you know, I can assure him that my officials in the Treasury are working as, as rapidly as possible, but also uh, to ensure that it actually works. And one of the, the questions he raised previously around the, what was included in the, in the scheme in terms of the range of public sector debts you know, has been a significant driver for me in those conversations, but I acknowledge and take on board his comments. But uh, Vicky Ford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I absolutely welcome this breathing space, which will help people who are facing debts that they cannot repay? And can I also join others in thanking Citizens Advice Bureau and organisations like the Trussell Trust, which helps to signpost people to better debt advice? They have told me how especially young people can get enormously concerned about getting cut off from their mobile phones, because if they lose their phones, they lose their communication, they lose their hope of finding work, for example. So can the Minister confirm that this will cover a wide range of debts and mean that people won't need to worry about losing their homes or losing their communications whilst their debts are being sought out? Yeah, yeah. 
I am extremely grateful for, for, for those observations and also the mention of Trussell Trust, which is headquartered in my constituency and has done a lot in this area. The principles underpinning this scheme are based on the insolvency services uh, system. So it includes all the, the debts broadly that they have. Um, there are uh, a small number of exceptions, for example, um, deductions for child uh, maintenance payments. Um, but we have designed this so that it is meaningful. But it, I would also like to say to the Honourable Lady, it's not about a, a, um, a holiday from ongoing payments. So it is dealing with arrears and debt. The expectation is that when people join this scheme, they obviously continue to pay for their everyday expenses as they occur. Catherine West. Is the Minister aware of the free online tool which I launched here in the House of Commons called Debt Hacker, which is run by activists to use the rules which the FCA has, but which are poorly understood by the general public, to help uh, customers or consumers to get back um, their £50 or whatever it is from companies which do use extortion to get money out of others? And is he also aware, with his broader role within the Treasury, of the fact that it's mainly NHS workers and public sector workers who are in this debt trap because wages have not kept up with the cost of housing and energy fuel bills and other costs? Well, the Honourable Lady raises two points. So I wasn't familiar with the Debt Hacker app. I shall seek it out, but it sounds like a very worthwhile initiative. Uh, I would just like to uh, respectfully say to the Honourable Lady that with respect to debt as a, um, uh, household debt, as a, uh, debt as a percentage of household income, um, in the fourth quarter of, of 2018 it was 139%. Now, ten years previously it was 160%. So whilst I recognise households are experiencing uh, strain at this time, um, you know, it, it is not quite as dire as she, as she sets out. Sir Edward Lee. Uh, loan sharks are the only unacceptable face of capitalism, but this is a complex area and the government should proceed with caution. Confidence in the market and in capitalism generally depends crucially on the payment of debt. I very much hope that the government will be consulting widely with the industry, with credit card companies particularly, and will consider piloting because there, there are unintended consequences in governments in their dying days trying to virtue signal regulating more in actually doing more damage than good. So please can we have piloting and widespread consultation. I'm very grateful to my honourable friend for his observations. This isn't virtual signalling, this is delivering a manifesto commitment uh, with the sectors involved. Uh, very carefully and methodically, and we do rightly have a robust regulator with powers to deal with uh, exploitative uh, uh, credit providers. And as I indicated in my earlier remarks, this is something that we're not complacent about. But I observe his concerns around making sure we implement this appropriately with the wider scent of the industry. Nick Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I welcome this uh, breathing space scheme? Uh, we found certainly in Blind and Gwent that it will be helpful because we discovered Wonga lent a million pounds a year to our brother's residents. Now, I suspect that a 60-day period won't be enough. The facts are that whilst the CAB are great, we've got insufficient guidance and support in our brother. Uh, I think 90 days or even more may be necessary. So can I ask the Minister to think carefully about that possibility? Yeah. I thank the Honourable Gentleman for his question. Certainly we, we keep all matters under review, but this 60 days has not come from nowhere. It has come from deep engagement with the sector. And uh, you know, as the Joanna Elson, the Chief Executive of the Money Advice uh, Trust said, you know, this new scheme could well become a game changer in our efforts to tackle problem debt as a society. I recognise there's a range of views, but we've looked at what's out there, we've looked at the Scottish experience, and we do believe that this is the right policy response. Order. Unless I'm much mistaken, <coughs> the Honourable Gentleman is in danger of being rather a naughty man. I am advised that the Honourable Gentleman beetled into the chamber halfway through the response by the opposition front bench spokesman. Sorry? I was advised that the Honourable Gentleman came through the double doors. I don't know whether he toddled out for some reason and then came back. 
If he's telling me, no, no, the Honourable Gentleman is chuntering from a sedentary position and gesticulating as well, but in a manner not altogether helpful at this juncture to the Chair. If the Honourable Gentleman says to me explicitly that he was here at the start of the statement, the very start, then I'm happy to indulge him. But otherwise, I would say he should count his lucky stars, because after all, he did get in at PMQs. He's had a jolly good day. I will take your advice. If you, if you think I was not here at the very start, then you are, you're surely correct, Mr Speaker, and I will sit down. <laughs> well, it's merely a question of remaining seated. <laughs> but, <laughs> well, after that Socratic dialogue, we'll leave it for now. But the, the Honourable Gentleman can bank his PMQ. He's had a PMQ. Very, Very well done. Evera Hobhouse. Yeah, financial difficulties are considered an adverse childhood experience. Facing pr problem debt in the family as a child can perpetuate cycles of poor mental health, low achievement, poor employment opportunities, uh, prison drug addiction and so on and so forth and I'm very pleased that actually earlier and um, the Honourable Member for Lucian Deptford drew um, attention to AC's adverse childhood experiences. Can the Minister assure me that the Breathing Space Scheme also includes advisers being trained in adverse childhood experiences and trauma so that the problems of financial hardships are not perpetuated into the next generation? The Honourable Lady makes a, a very reasonable point about the nature of the training for debt advisers. I can't give her a specific commitment on the uh, regulation of that because there are so many partners involved. But I will look into it and see what can be done to advance that very reasonable observation about the quality of advice given. Steve McKay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I welcome the proposals, although it has taken us since 2017 to get here, and it's going to take another two years to get the first part operational. I'm glad the Minister is moving swiftly and not dragging his feet. Good. Mr Speaker, one of the problems for people who get into debt, particularly when they get into debt over tax credits or benefit clawback, are the interest charges that are then applied as people try to uh, repay that, and then the management fee charges that are applied by the debt recovery agencies on top, so that the debt increasingly expands. Th those are both things the Minister could have a direct input into. Why does not he put a ceiling on those charges rather than simply a freeze? Well, the Honourable Gentleman makes a, uh, a, an interesting point, but it's not an area that I have direct responsibility over. What I can say to him is that uh, overpayments, where they're being reclaimed from UC, for example, will be included in this scheme. And uh, uh, you know, I, I can't comment on things that are outside of my control, but the point about actually doing this as quickly as possible is one I also hear very clearly from him. Uh, Heidi Allen. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. This is really brilliant news today, um, and I welcome the statement enormously, particularly the areas around government debt that are going to be included into this, um, and that the government has recognised the effect that debt has on people's lives and their ability to get out of it. Um, but can I actually urge, urge him to look at the government's own policies? And I suspect he'll know what I'm going to come on to. The five-week wait in universal credit is a big issue. Advanced payments are not the solution, because they themselves are a debt and are putting vulnerable people further into debt. So for me, and I've said this many, many times, the advance payment for the most vulnerable should be a grant, not a loan. As it is, we're handing out advance payments to about 60% of claimants, so we're handing out the money anyway. So it's not going to cost us anything, it's just a cash flow um, situation. We've heard on the Select Committee recently very moving and horrendous testimonies from women forced into sex work because they can't uh, make ends meet. They are um, not only working, up, we heard stories of going into a brothel for about three days, uh, work, working 20 hours out of 24, coming out with £150 as earnings, and it's giving them a roof over their heads as well. I can't believe, as our Prime Minister leaves us, that's the legacy she wants to leave behind. Please will the Minister look at this. This is a government debt too. Well, I acknowledge, uh, Honourable Ladies, uh, deep uh, interest and work in this over several years. Um, I think she's raising it points that are difficult for me to respond to because they're out with my responsibilities. I mean, the budget announced, a, as she will know, a £1.7 billion package of additional financial support for universal credit. I acknowledge she disagrees with one of those elements, uh, but it did involve reducing the maximum standard allowance at deduction from 40 to 30%. But you know, I cannot 
speak for an area of policy that I don't have responsibility for. I, uh, you know, what, I, what I'm delivering here is, the, is, a, is, a, uh, is a breathing space scheme that covers a very wide range of debts and reaches deep into you know, the public sector debts, which I was very you know, keen to do from the outset. Blue charge. Thank you very much. And <coughs> the uh, amounts that are being re re deducted from universal credit, as I uh, set out in a Westminster Hall debate recently, are a very significant part of people falling into problem debt. I agree that a lot of that is down to DWP policy, but I've seen many examples of people with tax credit overpayments being deducted from their universal credit being told that they have overpayments dating from maybe back to 2006, 2011, when they were supposed to have been written off. An average of £1,200 being deducted from their universal credit is contributing to people not having enough to get by on or pay their bills. Please, will the Minister, will the Treasury look into this as a matter of urgency and allow people to appeal against uh, such deductions being made? Well, uh, the Honourable Lady will, will also know, similar to the response to the previous question, this is about the administration of benefits and responsibility of the DWP. But I will certainly, but I will certainly uh, make clear uh, her observations to my colleagues in Government. Universal credit overpayments will be included from day one, uh, and I will make sure that I fully address her points and I will write her on the detail of it. Dr. Speaker, and I very much welcome the statement and the action that is going to be taken from today because research shows that more than 100,000 people each year who are in debt attempt suicide. So this has to be helpful in terms of giving them the support they need and improving mental health. What I want to ask the Minister is that one of the crisis periods in terms of suicide, particularly for young men, is uh, early adulthood. Can we ensure that financial education, and he can perhaps liaise with colleagues, is not just available in schools but also in colleges and universities, and that support is available there too? The Honourable Lady makes a very sensible point about the need for appropriate financial uh, education at all levels, and I think it needs to start early and it needs to endure through adolescence and into early adulthood. There are several initiatives underway to try and improve the quality of that advice. The setting up of the Money and Pensions Service and their broader remit in this area is one area, but there are also different partners, including uh, our banks through UK Finance, who are keen to do more. But I take her observations on very, very much. We now come to the ministerial statement. It's the Minister for Small Business, Consumers, Corporate Responsibility, Minister Kelly Tollerhurst. Thank you, um, Mr Deputy Speaker. I would like today to make a statement uh, about the Government's response to the Creating a Responsible Payment Culture Call for Evidence, which I have published today. Government is committed to supporting small and medium-sized enterprises to start well and grow, including a network of our 38 growth hubs across England providing advice, guidance and support. As part of our industrial strategy, we have an action plan to unlock over £20 billion of investment in innovation and high potential businesses. And where we see practices that unfairly constraint SME finance choices, we are prepared to act. For example, we recently removed a barrier that was preventing some SMEs from using invoice finance because of prohibitive contract terms imposed by their customers. This new measure is expected to provide a long-term boost to the UK's economy worth almost a billion pounds. Last year, we launched a call for evidence asking for views on how to create a responsible payment culture for small businesses. While there are a number of measures already in place to tackle late payments, from the prompt payment code, the ability to charge interest on late, and, um, late payments, and increased transparency through the payment practice reporting duty. The call for evidence told us that there is more to do to improve the payment landscape. This is why today I am announcing that I will now take further and firmer action to tackle the scourge of late payments. While maintaining a holistic approach to the cultural change 
by using all the avenues available to us in this space. I will be shortly launching a consultation seeking views on strengthening the Small Business Commissioner's ability to assist and advocate for small businesses in the area of late payments. Through the provision of powers to compel the disclosure of information and seeking views on the merit of the Commissioner's potential, potentially issuing penalties for poor payment practices. When finding that large businesses have poor or unfair payment practices, we want to seek views for the Small Business Commissioner's ability to apply sanctions, such as binding payment plans or financial penalties. I am also announcing that the responsibility of the Voluntary Prompt Payment Code is to move to the Commissioner and be reformed. This will unify prompt payment measures with the Commissioner and address weaknesses within the current code operation. However, Mr Deputy Speaker, we have seen the impact of the uh, strengthening of the code since our announcement in October where earlier on in the year we saw five businesses being removed from the code, with 12 being suspended, and the next round of uh, compliance currently underway. I will take a tough compliance approach to large companies who do not comply with the payment practice reporting duty. The legislation allows for the prosecution of those who do not comply, and I will use this enforcement power against those who do not comply where necessary. Mr Deputy Speaker, I can inform the House that we are already writing to those businesses who we have assessed to be within scope to remind them of their duty. Government will launch a business basics fund competition with funding of up to one million, which will encourage SMEs to utilise payment technology. We have recognised that tech adoption has had a positive impact on the productivity of small businesses. With this competition, coupled with the Small Business Commissioner strategy to deliver advice, signposts and provide a clear pathway for small businesses when they feel they need support. I also intend to establish a ministerial-led group to bring together key government departments to act on improving prompt payment across both the public and private sectors. We are working with UK finance investments and the financial sector to review the role supply chain finance plays in fair and prompt payments, including the potential for an industry-led standard for good practice in supply chain finance. This, Mr Deputy Speaker, reporting back to the Business Secretary by the end of the year. We also want to bring greater transparency to how supply chain finance is reported in company accounts and assessed in audits. And by working with the Financial Reporting Council to develop guidance and build it into their sampling of companies' accounts. Supply chain finance can provide an affordable finance option for SMEs, but they do need to be, assure, be assured that the terms are fair. Our modern industrial strategy aims to make Britain the best place to start and grow a business, and removing barriers to growth is key to this. The response to the call for evidence and the package of measures that I am announcing today will tackle the continued issue of late payments and ensure that this happens. I want to put on record, Mr Deputy Speaker, that uh, I offer great thanks to organisations such as the FSB and their campaign, Fair Pay, who have campaigned so hard for movement uh, from government. Also, to the hundreds of businesses that have taken part and engaged comprehensively with the Department in uh, being able to assess the call for evidence. And finally, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I would like to thank the Bayes Select Committee for their significant work on this issue and the work that they will continue to do, as I'm sure they will hold us to account with the improvements that we are announcing today. 
I therefore, Mr. De uh, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, would like to place a copy of the Government's response in the libraries of the House today, and I commend this statement to the House. Yeah. Shadow Minister Bill Esterson. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I, I, unfortunately, I have only just received a copy of the Minister's statement. I don't know why there was the delay, but it, 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 uh, it wasn't particularly helpful in preparing. But there we are. She's, she has graciously apologised. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, late payment is believed to be the cause of 50,000 business failures each year at a cost to the economy of £2.5 billion uh, along with thousands of jobs. Those are figures from the Federation of Small Business. The Minister is right to pay tribute to them for the uh, brilliant work they do advocating for small businesses on this issue and on so many uh, others. Now, she, in the press statement she made earlier, reported a fall in the scale of the problem of small business. Um, I just caution her, she quoted the excellent work of the Bayes Select Committee, I caution her that they suggested evidence that payment terms are growing uh, longer to mask some of this problem, and perhaps that's something she can address in some of the proposals she's outlined. Uh, we welcome the steps announced today as an important start in tackling the scourge of late payment. Uh, indeed, I tabled amendments to the Enterprise Act, uh, which created the post of the Small Business Commissioner, uh, where we would have given powers to insist on binding arbitration and fines for persistent late payment. The Government rejected those amendments at the time, so we put them in our 2017 manifesto, along with requirements for anyone bidding for a government contract to pay their suppliers in 30 days. So it's good to see the, the government catching up with us um, today and what they're proposing. The, the Small Business Commissioner does great work with the £1.35 million in his revenue budget. Uh, and the, uh, I understand 12 members of staff at his disposal. But there are limits to what he can do. And whilst the £3.8 million recovered by the, uh, small business, the, the Commissioner is important to those businesses affected. It is a fraction of the money withheld by late payers, which is in the tens of billions by any of the estimates available to us. So can the Minister tell, tell us what extra budget the Commissioner will be given to discharge the additional responsibilities she is proposing uh, and when, what the timescales are for the consultations? The accountability of company boards is a step in the right direction, but it will be important to compare the experience of the supplier with the reported practice in company accounts. So how will the Minister ensure that what is reported is the time from the date of supply of goods and services rather than the date of recording of invoice, which any accountant knows can be significantly different and is often subject to delay when invoices are mysteriously lost or queried uh, by accounts departments. Uh, and can she say how this will add to the existing duty to report and when the consultation on uh, giving the powers on duty to report to the Small Business Commissioner will take place uh, uh, as well? A number of companies who are members of the Prompt Payment Code, as the Minister told us, have been found not to comply with the code. The scandal of Carillion is an example of abuse of that code. We saw payment uh, times of 120 to 180 days becoming the norm. Policing of the code being given to the Small Business Commissioner is a sensible idea. So can the Minister say again what additional resources for powers uh, will be given to the, the, uh, the, the Commissioner? Uh, the use of project bank accounts would have prevented the £2 billion loss to 38,000 suppliers in the Carillion fiasco. Can she say what consideration the Government is giving to extending the use of project bank accounts? I also note the Government are making a pledge to force bidders for Government contracts over £5 million from the 1st of September to pay 95% of their invoices in 60 days. That's in line with the prompt payment code, but only in line with the lower end of the code's requirements. Why not make it a 30 days requirement? Uh, one complaint of business is the public sector is a source of some of the worst practice. She mentioned the public sector in her uh, statement. Uh, another is also that smaller firms are often at fault in delaying payments. So uh, can she say when she expects action to be taken on public sector and on other small business delays too. Uh, 
The problems of late payment need significant changes in practice. Today's statement announces a series of measures which, if properly resourced, could make a significant difference. Businesses deserve a change of culture. The economy and country needs a change in practice. In broadly welcoming these measures, I hope that the government's delivery matches the rhetoric. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And um, I, do, I would like to put on record my apologies uh, for the Honourable Member not having received my statement in a uh, sufficient amount of time. That, that was not uh, the intention at all. Um, and I hope, um, with, through the many debates that we've had uh, across the, in the House, he will understand that that's not how I tend to hopefully work with him. Um, I also want to thank him for his recognition of uh, the fact that the announcements we are making today um, should have an impact on the uh, late payment issues that many small businesses have, have often referred to. And one of the things that has been absolutely clear since I have been Minister, and actually prior to being elected in the House, when I was a small business owner myself, uh, late payments was something that particularly always was raised by uh, companies when dealing with large organisations, and I'm very pleased to be able to be moving forward. Um, it is true that the um, amount of money owed in late payments has halved, um, and also I do want to recognise the work that has been done by the Small Business Commissioner since his inception um, uh, which is just over, well, coming up to a year and a half. Um, he has collected uh, over £3.5 million in late payments. And um, the honourable gentleman is, is right to, to question around the Small Business Commissioner and, and, when that, and when that consultation will take place. We want that to happen uh, quite quickly. One of the uh, uh, key things that came out of the call for evidence from the people that responded was that they wanted to see the Small Business Commissioner having more powers and using that as uh, an umbrella to encompass a number of enforcement abilities for the Small Business Commissioner to act on behalf of small businesses. Now, um, so as I've, as I've said, the uh, consultation uh, will be coming uh, soon, um, and it's something that I would like uh, to take place with speed. But as I just want to iterate, some of the, uh, this will be a massive step change for the Small Business Commissioner as we seek views on whether to uh, allow uh, the Small Business Commissioner to um, apply sanctions such as binding payment plans and financial penalties. This will be a step forward on behalf of the Small Business Commissioner. And I would like to point out that the Small Business Commissioner himself has been very vocal in his, um, his request for us to give him more powers uh, to enable him to represent and uh, help the small businesses that, um, that come to him. And Mr. Speaker, Mr. Mr Deputy Speaker, maybe I could just mention a couple of other points. One of the things that we will also be seeking views on around this is whether the small business minister will have the ability to refer um, uh, uh, topics and subjects to the Small Business Commissioner for the investigation. Currently at the moment, the Small Business Commissioner will only investigate once a complaint has come from a small business. So we are looking in other ways in which that uh, can be carried out and further investigations can be carried out by the Small Business Commissioner. But that obviously is just a, a, a sample of what will, what will hopefully be clu uh, included in the, uh, in the uh, consultation. In regards to boards, um, he is quite right. Um, it, uh, we are pleased, going on the back of the Chancellor announcements in the spring, to give audit committees the power to review, review payment practices and for that to be reported in an annual report. We are working with the FRC and the Bayes Frameworks, uh, Frameworks Department to work out in which is the best way in which that can, that can happen. Um, we do uh, hope, and what we are asking the FRC, is that with the new duty that did come in in January, the strategic reporting requirement, um, asking the FRC how the payment reporting um, practices 
uh, payment reporting duty is actually being covered in that new duty, and if, if at all. But I will uh, reassure the honourable gentleman that, um, if necessary, we will legislate to make that happen. In regards to the voluntary prompt, prompt payment code, uh, the, CIM, uh, the CICM, who have uh, really worked hard over recent months with the strengthening that took place in October, we are pleased that um, the, uh, the data that's being, that has been gathered with the uh, payment reporting duty has enabled us to really cross-examine and examine that data and has helped with the compliance of the voluntary code. And we believe, and the CICM believe, that actually the best place is for that to be under the Small Business Commissioner. So effectively, it is a one-stop shop for the Small Business Commissioner and also a very easily identifiable pathway for small businesses themselves. Um, he is right to talk about project bank accounts, and um, actually some uh, members here today, including um, the Honourable uh, Lady from Bury St Edmunds, who in the past has... Uh, uh, lobbied me significantly in regards to retentions and, and how that would work. One thing that I uh, would like to just highlight is that we have been uh, clear, we have told the, can, the, the industry that we expect them to come to consensus on a way to move forward and if not, uh, we will take action. Um, in regards to um, uh, government, uh, government uh, contracts, he knows, um, obviously, the announcement uh, that uh, from the 1st of September, any company bidding for contracts over £5 million will be expected to, in 95 days, uh, sorry, 95 per cent of their invoices in 60 days, and if they don't achieve that, uh, they will not uh, necessarily be uh, able to bid for further contracts. But he also says, and we had the new ambition that was launched in April 19, of where that 90% uh, of invoices should be paid within five days to small businesses that are undisputed. What possible? And like the uh, Minister at the Dispatch Box, I too ran a, a small business and recognised the challenge that late payments have on small businesses. And it's uh, to the credit of this government that it created the role of small business commissioner. But I note from the uh, Honourable Lady's remarks that the, she's having a consultation about additional powers for the small business commissioner. Could she be a little bit more clear about when those powers may be available to him? He's often said that he needs more powers. And will those powers include the uh, powers to fine when uh, businesses fail to honour their commitments. We heard in the Select Committee of many businesses that signed up to the Prompt Payment Code but failed to adhere uh, to the terms within it. And uh, We just need a little bit more beef for the uh, Small Business Commissioner to get his uh, teeth into that. And Finally, can I ask whether she will consider making it mandatory to add interest to overdue accounts, which will give a real incentive to businesses that are delaying payments to get their payments made on time? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I can uh, inform my honourable friend that to give further powers to the Small Business Commissioner, it would indeed require primary legislation. That is why we will uh, seek views and consult on that. Um, we do want to give uh, the Small Business Commissioner, um, and that is why we will seek uh, those under a consultation in order to, as I have tried to outline, the ability, the potential ability to apply sanctions on businesses that don't comply with requests for information, um, in such as court orders or financial penalties, and, and as I have said, sanctions such as binding payment plans. In regards to the mandatory ability to apply interest, um, we believe that um, the, there is current low take up of the application of, of interest on invoices. So there does need to be an education piece for small businesses, and that is something very much that we're hoping to achieve with the Small Business Commissioner, with all these uh, elements coming under one roof, so to speak, so that he is able to uh, launch an ambitious uh, PR and st strategy to enable small businesses to really understand what powers exist for them to use already. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for advanced sight of her statement, which in our case arrived in uh, plenty of uh, time uh, to look at. Um, 
Mr Deputy Speaker, we welcome initiatives to uh, curb the issue uh, around late payments, but let's be frank, this doesn't go nearly yeah. far enough. For anyone tuning into last night's Tory hard Brexit, Brexit hustings, it will come as no surprise that the UK Government remains opposed to taking the steps required to protect Scottish business. So, does the Minister have the good grace to agree that it is now beyond a joke that, in place of serious policy steps, her statement merely proposes some minor technological measures and platitudes on best practice? And she did not fully answer the question, so can she confirm that she has looked at the Scottish Government's project bank account scheme? And has she learned any lessons on how that is protecting smaller contractors and subcontractors for public procurement uh, projects? And with the Federation of Small Businesses stating that if all payments were made on time, 50,000 more businesses could be kept open each year, it is clear that small business needs legal protection. So does she now regret her government's failure to support my honourable friend, the member for Kilmarnock and Loudoun's 2017 Construction Industry Protection of Cash yeah. Retentions Bill right. to stop late payments in that sector? Yeah. Indeed, her government's failure to extend that sort of protection across the economy for all SMEs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And, um, I uh, stand here today uh, and make announcements, but I also think it's very much we need to recognise we need to recognise that it is around culture and we want to use all the tools in the box and that is to make sure that we legislate and take action where possible, uh, but we also work with industry and work with businesses to change the culture. And it is not, it is not right that large firms uh, take advantage of uh, smaller businesses in regards to their late payments. And this is why today we are bringing forward our response to the call for evidence in order to stem the scourge of late payments. In regards to his point on project bank accounts, um, as I briefly outlined to, the, uh, to my response to the, to the previous question, project bank accounts and uh, reuse of retentions obviously is a concern for, for many, and it's something that uh, is, for me, is part of the whole late payment arena, and that is why I have said we have worked with the industry and we have heard the views from both sides. And there has yet to be a consensus found within the industry. So the, the challenge that we have set is that industry must come to a way forward or we will take action. And uh, to answer his question, I have indeed looked at uh, some of the uh, work that has been gone on in Scotland, but also that uh, what has happened in Northern Ireland as well. Um, I also just want to highlight to him that actually the FSB um, said today small businesses will be delighted with this announcement today. FSB has worked hard uh, with government to create a whole broad approach to late payments within the UK large companies and empower aud audit committees to look after the supply chain. Together with these measures to strengthen the Small Business Commissioner's powers and reform the Prompt Payment Code, measures today could finally see an end to poor payment practices. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. The words that she just spoke were the words of my constituent, Mr Mike Cherry, and there can be no greater praise than such an advocate of the uh, uh, small business and the FSB support these measures, so uh, I commend her on them. But would she also agree that one of the main challenges uh, is not late payment but prompt payment? Uh, we see far too many big businesses continuing to extend the payment terms 150 days, 180 days, or even more than that, which is simply not acceptable and unfeasible for many small businesses. So will she add that to her to-do list and really make a difference for small businesses? Well, I thank my honourable friend uh, for his question and recognise uh, he has a particular interest having been uh, the, my predecessor in this post and somebody he took uh, a significant interest on. He is absolutely correct. Uh, prompt payment is a uh, particular concern for, for businesses and for large companies who alter their payment terms. 
but part of the consultation and why we are seeking to give the Small Business Commissioner or seek views on giving the Small Business Commissioner more powers is that currently he does act for small businesses where they have struggled on prompt payments and currently he has no binding powers. So therefore, we very much feel that this could be uh, an element within the small, small Business Commissioner's suit of armour in tackling late and non-payments. Chair the Select Committee, Rachel Reeves. Thank yeah. you very yeah. much, yeah. Mr Deputy Speaker. When our Select Committee looked into this issue, many small businesses insisted on giving evidence in private, mm. so worried they were about retaliation from the big businesses yeah. that they supplied. Larger businesses, including Morrisons, Aldi and WH Smiths, are not signatories to the Prompt Payment Code, whilst Boots pay a discount to suppliers for the privilege of them being paid on time. The, the power balance is so imbalance is so great now between the bigger businesses and the smaller ones. I would urge the government and the minister to look again and to make the prompt payment code mandatory yeah, and bring it down to a benchmark of 30 days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, I do thank the Honourable Lady for contribution, and I do want to highlight again the, the significant work that her committee has done on this issue, and, and actually the way they have worked with our department on some of these issues. She's absolutely right to highlight that the power imbalance, and that is where many small businesses feel that they are unable to speak out. That is one of the reasons uh, within the seeking views within our consultation around powers for the Small Business Commissioner. We will look to have that ability for the Small Business Minister to be able to make a referral to the Small Business Commissioner and have similar investigation powers to that of what is used in the um, grocery adjudicators uh, code and, and their ability there. Um, it is absolutely right that, uh, and also the ability, sorry, I, I forgot to mention, the ability for the Small Business Commissioner to carry out an investigation. Uh, without the, um, without the uh, small business having to report, but obviously, and there is some suggestion on whether that maybe could be anonymised. So she does raise a, uh, a very important point. I am very much aware of the point that she highlights, and it's going to be very much part of my drafting with the team in regards to the consultation. Samuel Wilson. I welcome this statement from the Minister, and I know that she is committed to ensuring that small businesses are dealt with fairly. Could I just ask her, would, uh, uh, it has already been mentioned about the project bank accounts which were introduced by the Northern Ireland uh, Executive, um, a, a, a measure which now applies to hundreds of millions of pounds of government contracts and which ensures that it is not the main contractor who gets the money, but that money goes directly to the subcontractors when they have completed the work. And that avoids any desire for the main contractors to hold on to the money, to bargain with the small companies and indeed stops the small companies having to take the initiative which sometimes they are afraid to take. Will she work with Northern Ireland um, uh, officials to ensure that the lessons learnt in Northern Ireland can be applied here? Minister. Well, I uh, thank the Honourable Gentleman uh, for raising that, and I would just like to highlight his particular interest in this area and thank him for what he has said today, but also to highlight that he was indeed uh, one of the ministers responsible in Northern Ireland when project bank accounts were, were enacted there. And um, he is right to say that there are absolutely some merits in project bank accounts, and he does know that this is an area that I have taken particular interest in and will be uh, work using continuous work on that. Uh, I would like to say, though, that with government contracts, well, the government is clear that uh, where project bank accounts can be used, they will. They not, aren't always um, a suitable form uh, of uh, measure within some uh, large contracts, but he is absolutely right. What I have announced today is a suite of tools to tackle late payment. Am I going to stay here today and say that in the future we, may, we won't have to do any more? Of course. Part of government and part of what we need to do in a changing economy and business environment is to make sure we keep looking, keep, and keep looking at ways in which we can make things easier for small businesses. Thank you. Deputy Speaker, and also thanks to the Minister for advance sight of her statement. 
Um, she talked about the challenges facing small business. Of course, Brexit is going to cause huge disruption to small businesses' supply chains with the added bureaucracy and tariffs. But on late payments, uh, this is a welcome statement. But can I ask her again the specific question that she was asked by the Business Select Committee Chair? Why not make the prompt payment code mandatory? Make it compulsory for large businesses. Why have this further delay on consultations and what have you? Make it mandatory, as we've been arguing for. Well, um, I uh, thank the Honourable Gentleman for welcoming the statement and the moves that this Government has made today. On the particular question on the Prompt Payment Code, he is absolutely right. It's a voluntary code. As it stands at the moment, there are over 2,000 signatories to that code, and they sign up to it and they commit to pay uh, their invoices 90 per cent within 60 days. As he will know, the new duty for payment reportings that this Government um, initiated, which... uh, 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 and, and currently, at the moment, we have had over 15,000 reports. This is a duty on companies to report biannually on their payment practices. So that's 15,000 reports for over 7,000 companies. That data has enabled the CICM to be able to scrutinise the voluntary co-payment data, and we have seen action. We are seeing that five businesses were removed from the code and 12 that have been suspended. I have outlined today that where people aren't complying with the legislation, we will take action, and we are continuing to move forward to strengthen that comp payment code, to close any, any any particular holes in, in, and weaknesses that there are. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. When it comes to cash retentions, twice the Minister said it is up to business to find a way or industry to find a way forward. It is actually government responsibility. Here, here. Mr Deputy Speaker, it is something like 40 years since it was first recommended that the use of cash retention in the construction industry was phased out. In my time as an M- MP, the government has consulted twice on it, they voted down amendments to the Enterprise Bill, and they refused to back my private members' bill, and they refused to back private members' bill from a member for Waveney. Instead of listening to the large Tier 1 contractors, will she pledge to take action and give a timescale for the phasing out of the use of cash with engines in the construction industry? Yeah, yeah. Well, the Honourable Gentleman raises the point about a uh, retention scheme. As I have outlined, he says it is not for industry, it is for, for government. Um, I have, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, spoken to industry representatives and uh, businesses and small businesses on this issue, and it is clear that the industry themselves have not come to a, uh, a, a single way forward in how the, how they are able to deal with this. So hopefully today, in some of the, uh, some of the measures that we are announcing around looking at supply chain finance and how that will move forward, will also make a big difference. But in regards to cash retentions, as I have been clear, you know, and I am quite happy to stand here today, I have said, and I said previously in the answer to my, the previous question, if industry cannot find a consensus on, what, uh, on the way forward, Government will step in and take action. Debbie Abrahams. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, first of all, I, I welcome uh, the Minister's uh, statement, um, and I would also like to put on the record my thanks for her meeting with me after I introduced uh, my project bank accounts bill earlier this year. However, these are actually the measures that she's introduced are actually recommendations from the 2013 inquiry that I had into late payments and you know six years on it is a a, a little late although I do recognize the minister's commitment but the measures that she introduces won't um, be any comfort to Neil Skinner who has a business in my constituency who lost 176,000 pounds when Carillion collapsed this isn't a one-off we know that there are other Carillions out there 380 small businesses closed directly as a result of the money um, she lost. So I cannot, un- as a result of Carillion, I cannot understand why she is so reticent after decades of this issue that she's still not going to act on project bank accounts. Well, um, I do recognise the Honourable Lady's uh, passion and commitment uh, in this area, and um, as I've uh, said to her uh, in previous meetings, that you know, I'm... I'm always happy to continue to work with her on that particular issue. 
project, ca project bank accounts have value. As I have said, uh, today I am announcing um, the measures that we are taking in relation to the call for, call for evidence. Um, I understand that uh, she may be disappointed in the time it has taken to bring these measures forward. But we are taking action, and it is this government that is taking action. These are uh, bad practices that have not just been happening over recent years. They have been happening for decades, and we, uh, this government, are finally taking action on this. She is absolutely to right to uh, mention um, her constituent and the losses that uh, the business suffered through the collapse of Carillion. And that is one of the reasons why we uh, want to make sure uh, we are analysing uh, on the analysis of Carillion's debt. At the end, there was an estimated debt of 900 million, um, which excluded 500 million of supply chain finance. So that's why we will be working with the Financial Council to find ways in which to bring transparency and how it is reported in companies' accounts uh, going forward. Um, and I hopefully um, this will address any of those larger failures in the future. Right, we now come to the 10 minute rule bill. Luke Pollard. I beg to move that leave be given to bring in a bill to require the government to prepare a strategy for recycling out of service Royal Navy nuclear submarines and to report annually on progress, to consult on extending decommissioning powers in Part 1 of the Energy Act 2004, to include the recycling of Royal Navy nuclear submarines, and to publish estimates of the taxpayer liability associated with such submarines and for connected purposes. Mr Deputy Speaker, every nuclear submarine Britain has ever had, we still have. There are 13 old nuclear submarines tied up in Devonport in Plymouth, and there are seven tied up in Ross Syth. When I was elected in 2017, I said I would make safely, securely and sustainably recycling these submarines one of my priorities. I have asked the Prime Minister two questions at PMQs about the lack of a funded plan to recycle these submarines. I have helped put together a cross-party campaign with, my honourable member, with the honourable member from Dunfermline and West Fife and the honourable member from Berwick-upon-Tweed. We have met ministers, submitted proposals, encouraged the questioning of the Public Accounts Committee, whose excellent report on this subject is also published today, and now we present our arguments and proposals in this bill. This bill has cross-party backing from a range of colleagues who are all as passionate as I am for that these nuclear submarines are recycled securely and safely. And I'm grateful for seeing so many of them in the chamber today. Yeah. Yeah. Many people may not be aware that we still have all the submarines that we have had serve in the Royal Navy. The 13 in Devonport and the 7 stored in Ross Scythe are potentially just the start of many more to enter storage. The oldest submarine stored in Devonport is HMS Valiant, which was launched in 1963 at the height of the Cold War. You can actually see these submarines on Google Maps. So if you're watching at the moment, zoom into Plymouth, and on the left-hand side of the city, <laughs> at Three Basin in Devonport, you'll be able to see lines of nuclear submarines, many of, them, many of them there for decades. Mr Deputy Speaker, it would be easy for me to make the cheap headlines by saying that there is a safety risk of these nuclear submarines. But populism is not my style, so I want to be clear that there is no immediate safety risk to our local communities yeah. from these submarines. Babcock do all they can to look after these submarines, ensuring that there's no leaks and no risk to our communities. And I thank them and the staff that do it for their work. Yeah. But Plymouth and Rossyth cannot be asked to look after these submarines indefinitely without a plan for their disposal. Now, this is a personal matter for me, as the son of a submariner who served on HMS Swiftshore and yeah. HMS Conqueror and worked on the refitting and extending the operational lives of many of these submarines as an engineer in Devonport, my family know these subs well. It is a point of curiosity not lost on my old man that one Pollard served on them and his son is busy trying to chop them up and dispose of them. <laughs> but, Mr Deputy Speaker, both Pollards are doing so in what is in the national interest. Yeah, yeah. We already have a civil nuclear programme dealing with the clean-up of our civil nuclear past. The tax-funded Nuclear Decommissioning Agency is working on clearing up 17 old nuclear sites, but their work does not currently cover decommissioned nuclear submarines. The taxpayer has an unlimited liability for the clean-up, as clearly stated in the 2004 Energy Act, and rightly so. 
We know that nine of the 20 submarines retired since 1980 contain nuclear fuel, which aren't at risk currently, but do need to be dealt with. My bill seeks to prepare the ground for the extension of that unlimited taxpayer liability from civil nuclear cleanup to include these old Royal Navy submarines. If we extend the line of credit from the Treasury, work can begin and we can genuinely deal with our nuclear legacy. Now, these submarines are not only taking up valuable space in our dockyards, but they're costing the taxpayer millions of pounds a year in storage and maintenance mm -hmm. costs. The Public Accounts Committee have today released a report which puts the cost at the taxpayer at £30 million a year. This money could and should be used for dismantling and defuelling those submarines and finally dealing with these retired boats. The report warns the MOD are reaching a crisis point in terms of space. It says that the MOD will run out of space to store these submarines by mid-2020s. In the next four years, three more Trafalgar-class submarines will need to be stored somewhere as they are replaced by the new astute subs being built in Barrow. The PM told me in this chamber they will be stored at Devonport, taking our number of old retired submarines up to 16. A decade later, the four Vanguard-class Trident subs will need to be stored when they're taken out of service and replaced by the new Dreadnought-class submarines. But where will they go? There's no space at Devonport, and Recife is closed for more, any more submarines. That's why we need a funded plan to deal with the ones we have to make space for the ones that will be coming out of service soon. Instead of further delaying this decision, it's clear that we need action now from government. Now, I know Rosyth has plans for the dock space currently used by these submarines, and in Devonport, I want three basin to be used to enhance the baseporting location for the brilliant new Type 26 frigates we'll be getting, and hopefully the Type 31 frigates in due course. Over a year ago, I helped kick off this campaign with colleagues from all parties. We wrote to the Prime Minister, urging her to fund a defuelling and dismantling strategy. These submarines won't go away on their own, and although they have been hidden out of sight for many, many, many years, the longer this recycling project drags on, it becomes more and more expensive to deal with those submarines. Right. Retired submarines have been ignored by governments of all colours for now over 50 years. They need to be dealt with properly. And it's an issue that I think all our parties can unite on to secure a safe and decent future. A properly funded defuelling and dismantling strategy, broadly submarine recycling, would present opportunities to invest in skills and innovation. It would also foster greater collaboration between the defence and the civil nuclear sectors. The workforce already moves between these sectors, as does the science of decommissioning. But at the moment, the government still deals with them in two very distinct silos. There is an efficiency for the public purse in collaborating, and the future really must be more joined up. That's both at the ministerial level, to the official level, to the work on the ground and in the docks. Decommissioning is a highly skilled and technical work which creates good jobs and supports the local economy and community. Mr Deputy Speaker, above all, recycling these old nuclear submarines is in the national interest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Plymouth and Rosyth cannot be asked to store old nuclear submarines indefinitely. That is why we need a properly funded plan for these submarines using the same principles as the Civil Nuclear Cleanup Programme. Because these submarines must be recycled safely, securely and sustainably. Now, I know once people find out <coughs> about these submarines, they are concerned about what will happen to them. But we also know that once you've seen those submarines, be it on Google Maps, in person by driving alongside the docks in Devonport and Recife, or on the warship tours along the dockyard in Devonport, you then have no choice, no choice, but to think about what should happen to them, what should happen to those submarines. And that's why, on behalf of my colleagues from Berwick-upon-Tweed and from Dunfermline, West and, uh, Dunfermline and West Fife, I present this bill as part of a campaign that will not rest until we win, to highlight these subs and demand politely but firmly that a solution is found. Mr Deputy Speaker, we need to acknowledge that these nuclear submarines exist and need to be dealt with. We need a proper plan from the MOD for recycling the submarines with a clear time frame, and we need to extend the unlimited taxpayer liability to ensure this essential work can be delivered. That is what my bill will do, 
and that is why it has cross-party support, and I hope ministers will pick it up and run with it. Thank you. Yeah. Let the Honourable Member have leave to bring in the Bill. The question is that the Honourable Member have leave to bring in the Bill, as many of that opinion say aye. Aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Who will prepare to bring in the Bill? Anne-Marie Trevelyan, Douglas Chapman, Dr Julian Lewis, Meg Hillier, Mrs Madeleine Moon, Ruth Smith, Sir Gary Streeter, Richard Harrington, Dr Alan Whitehead, Jamie Stone and Tanmanjit Singh Desi and myself. Luke Pollard. Nuclear Submarine Recycling Reporting Bill. Second reading what day? Tomorrow. Tomorrow! Okay, well done, Luke. The clerk will now proceed to read the orders of the day. Parliamentary Buildings Restoration and Renewal Bill, not a... It's lovely to be out on such a sunny evening in Edinburgh, but it's a shame that we have to be out tonight protesting against the two-child cap and the rape clause. Well more than a year since Alison Thulis, my colleague at Westminster, first spotted it in the small print of a Tory budget. I'm very glad to see such a huge demonstration today and so many people still coming along one year after the rape clause came into force um, to show their opposition to this vile and despicable policy. The UK government have never been able to justify this policy and we saw that this week with Esther McVeigh's pathetic attempts to say that the rape clause was somehow double support for women and that gives them some kind of chance to talk about the most um, appalling and disturbing experience of their life. As you can see behind me, we're at the very beginning of the All Under One Banner Rally. You can obviously hear the, drum, the pipers behind me as events are about to kick off. It's time to aim high, look resolutely outwards and never, ever accept second best. Above all, it's time to believe that we can. We can build that better country we know is possible. And friends, we will. If you enjoy watching our programmes, please help us to be Scotland's independent broadcaster by signing up to become a Broadcasting Scotland supporter. Wherever you stand, get the fresh view of what's happening in Scotland with iScot. Celebrate everything about our country with intelligent, in-depth insight from lifestyle, culture to puzzles and all the opinions you'll need. Whether it's digital or by post, subscribe now to iScot.